Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Welcome to this episode of The Murder Part. Tonight, we'll be looking at the case of Brian Koberger. We'll get started with introductions. Jeff? My name is Jeff Pinson. I'm a licensed mental health counselor in Pennsylvania and Delaware, and I specialize in the treatment of OCD and other anxiety disorders. And uh, if you leave a comment uh, below or a question, we may respond in future episodes. Uh, and if I had not become a counselor, uh, what I really wanted to do was be an undercover food truck security guard. Uh, I mean, imagine that kind of title. That would really be a, a conversation starter at parties. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. uh, but very specific, and uh, I don't have any experience in that. Didn't go to school for it. Didn't, doesn't, don't, I really don't know anything about it, but it sounds cool. Turns out, because I don't know anything about it, no experience, nothing, no knowledge of it, turns out nobody would want to hire me for that. There's not even a job available for that. So, counselor. Mm. Yeah, most food trucks, if they need to, to uh, be secure, they just kind of lock the doors and drive away. Well, I mean, you're talking some expensive food. That's where I come in. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. No, no, no chance. Nah. Mm. Another, another career ending in, in counseling. That's shattered, the, shattered, mm. dream. shattered dreams. Oh. Shattered dreams. Shattered dreams. Mike? All right. My name is Mike Smith, also a licensed professional counselor in the state of Delaware. I focus on uh, narrative therapy and geek therapy, uh, and uh, I'm a self-styled expert in all things geek. And at, at one time in my life, I had wanted to um, offer a unique service of taking taking people's trash from, from their trash cans and then just kind of distributing it out amongst the neighbors. Oh, yeah. Just you know? level things off a bit. Yeah, just yeah. level things off. I mean, some people, they have trash that's just piled up way over top of their trash cans, and other people, they like got nothing in there. So, mm -hmm. you know, take, take that trash, put it over there. Turns out people pay for trash services already, and they didn't want to pay for an extra service on top oh, of that. And, okay. You know, just, it, it all fell apart. Mm. It was really, it was, it, it, it was terrible. I see that kind of as a Robin Hood kind of thing. Taking from the rich and giving to the poor, taking from the overcrowded trash cans to the undercrowded trash cans. Uh, I, I think it's a great service. It would it would have been would have been. I think it would have yeah. been. But you know they got they got trash trucks that drive around and mm. just pick up the trash and haul it away. You know? oh. mm. So counseling. Yeah, yeah counseling. That's a mm. shame. Ended up, wow. ended up there. Sorry to hear that. Mike. Tough break. Yeah, tough it's, break. It's, it's rough. So we have uh, we've covered other high profile cases, right? Uh, and you know, we, we talked about this before, high profile, kind of the mid-range ones, and then like unheard of cases. This one definitely qualifies as high profile. Yeah, right. It's kind of an understatement. Sometimes when these cases come across the news, you see these kind of unusual things, and you're like, I wonder if that's going to catch on as a, an area of public interest or if it's just kind of you know, fade, fade away. There was no doubt when the news came across with the four murders that, uh, that we're going to talk about in this video, that it was going to be a huge case. From the, from the right. first second, you knew yeah. that this was going to dominate true crime news for the next you know, few months mm. and be, be uh, really um, salient for several years until the you know, trial, presumably right. the trial that's coming up. Right. Uh, you know, I think you, know, you have here uh, a house that had uh, six occupants, I believe. Mm-hmm. And and uh, an individual who may be or may not be Brian Koberger, you know, presumption of innocence, right. who entered and uh, killed four mm. with a knife, right? Just, Went past a fifth. Just doesn't it doesn't make much sense because that's just not how these things work. Right. Uh, but it harkens back to Ted Bundy and the uh, the Florida murders. We can talk about that. But but yeah, it's one of these cases that I think instantly just captured everybody's attention. It was so bizarre and horrible. And unusual, right? Uh, all wrapped up into this one case. Yeah. So let's hear. Let's hear. I know a lot of people are familiar with this case, but let's right. hear. I, I think that um, this is one of those cases that kind of it captured so much attention. Before we get into the details, yeah. it captured so much attention that it's become what we can refer to as a canon case. Mm -hmm. Like everybody yep. who followed the case wants, you know, they got the details. And we'll try and get as many of the details right. But please forgive us if we do miss some details. I mean, there's going to be. Some people are like, no, it was wrong. It was it was four twelve p.m., <laughs> not four thirteen. You know, uh, I might get the VIN number of his car wrong. Forgive right. me. If, on we, that. if we report the VIN number and it is wrong, please. It's only going to be off by a digit or two. Right. You transposed no the J and the K. You're a monster. <laughs> right. Uh, but but this the, the 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 broad strokes of the case I think are what drew everybody in in the first mm -hmm. place. Yeah. And then yeah. Yeah. Uh, a lot of it was um, 
I, I think a lot of the reason behind the Canon stuff is the, the, the sleuths. Right. I think the internet became obsessed with trying to solve this case. Well, that's it. Like sometimes with these, these super high profile crimes, we don't know who did it. Sometimes it's obvious. Right. Like, like we just right away, you know, okay. Like Scott Peterson, it was the obvious suspect. It wasn't, it wasn't like a whodunit. It was like, mm -hmm. right. did, did he do it or, you know, well, he did it, but can he be convicted? That was right. the only right. question. But this one for the, the initial period was a mystery. Mm -hmm. Like, like, so you had, yeah, you had people analyzing security footage, what, what little was available uh, of the victims as they were uh, out that night. Mm -hmm. And, you know, looking at every shadow, you know, was that the killer? I saw a little triangle shadow in the corner. Um, and as it turns out that Brian Koberger, I like, was not on any of those. Right, right. <laughs> the police had access, of course, to more information. Um, and, and that's what led to him being arrested. And we'll talk about that. But yeah, let's hear a summary of uh, this particular case. Yeah, sure. So Brian Koberger, born December 21st, 1994, 27 years old at the time of the crime, uh, 28 years old currently. He's born in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania. It's an important detail because we reference that later in this as well. Uh, he attended a few different colleges uh, at the time of the uh, crime. He was a PhD student studying criminology at Washington State University. Um, and uh, the timeline of the crime, somewhere between 4 and 4.25 a.m. Uh, on November 13th, 2022 in Moscow, Idaho, uh, four victims were unfortunately murdered, um, stabbed with some kind of long knife, according to the um, coroner's report. Maddie Mogan, Kaylee Gonzalez, uh, Zana Kernodal, and Ethan Chapin. Um, the three women lived in that home. They rented that home, and uh, Ethan was a boyfriend of one of them. And uh, there, there appeared to be some defense wounds for some of them. Uh, some of them may have been um, stabbed or murdered in their sleep, um, but of course they don't know all the details. There was also a dog in the room, um, and uh, the dog was unharmed. The dog was barking throughout, but was unharmed. Uh, there were also two other occupants, as he said, Dr. Grande, in the house. Uh, they were in another room on the second floor. Uh, the one that is not named... Um, I think the initials were DM in the one report, uh, looked out at some point, I think two or three times on the last time, uh, looked out of a room and saw a tall man that she didn't know walking toward her. Uh, and j the man just walked right past her, didn't harm her, didn't acknowledge her, uh, didn't do anything. And she shut her door and locked it. And, um, there was no interaction between the two. Which is another strange detail that you wouldn't often see, and there's we don't know the reason why that happened, but uh, it, it's you know he, he was maybe there for a purpose. We don't know, of course, but it was strange details that whatever happened that night or that morning, um, yeah, that's probably some of the intrigue of this. Is it's not like he get, went there for everybody, and it was very obvious that he was just there to to kill, but uh, you know, very specific perhaps. So. Um, uh, this roommate uh, didn't call the police for another few hours until uh, that, that late morning. Um, for some reason, we don't know the uh, reason for that, of course. Uh, police say there was no sign of forced entry and no weapon was, has been recovered at this time. Um, and they hadn't had a murder case in Moscow since uh, 2015. So it's not something that happens often there. Uh, December 7th, police released um, informa some information. There was a white Hyundai Elantra uh, that was near the crime scene around the time of the crime and, and uh, seen leaving there after that. They eventually linked that car to Brian Koberger um, because he was going to Washington State University and they were able to link him, follow him using uh, easy pass information, uh, aerial tracking from aircraft as well as uh, people on the ground. Tracked him back to his home in um, Albrightsville, uh, Pennsylvania. He was with his dad driving back from Washington to Pennsylvania. And... Um, he got stopped twice for tailgating within like 10 minutes of each other, which is interesting. Uh, and they have body cam footage of that. But uh, another interesting detail, you have this body cam footage that doesn't match, of course, with the case, uh, with the murders. But uh, it's still interesting because you get a, an image, a video, two videos of this suspected murder and his dad. So um, uh, followed him back to his house and they were following him for some time saw that he was doing a lot of different things. He would regularly throw out trash in different trash cans, hope maybe to try to avoid police finding his DNA I, or something. I knew that was a good idea. Right, mm -hmm. right. Oh, well, no, it's probably not a good idea. It's, it's criminal To activity. help murderers. 
helping murderers <laughs> hide their tracks. I, I guess it's a good thing I didn't do that. Well, that's true. Dodged a bullet on that one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and he would he would wear gloves to throw his trash out, and he appeared to be very cautious of his actions. Clean the inside and out car, outside of his car very thoroughly. Uh, so Brian was brought into custody December thirtieth, twenty twenty two, in Pennsylvania. Maintained his innocence. Was appeared to be unsure why the police were there raiding his home. Uh, when they were raiding his home, he was placing his trash in plastic bags, individual baggies, and throwing it out. Just another, he was wearing gloves again, just another odd piece of this. Mm. Yeah, um, from, from what I understand, he was wearing gloves all the time while he, while he was at home. Yeah, yeah. Um, something we haven't seen since 2020. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's true. That's true. And I, I suppose it could be... Uh, he would try to, could have been trying to cover that with, oh, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sick. I'm just trying to keep maybe keep germs away from family. But, maybe. Um, yeah. but it, it seemed suspicious even to his family. That's true. Yeah. So we'll go into more details, but there's a knife sheath found in the home where the murders took place. His DNA was on that knife sheath. Mm. Uh, Brian was described um, by a lot of different people as creepy lonely but also intelligent um but also not really good with people so there's there's personality factors here that perhaps come together that might paint a picture of who he is um but at the same time we really don't know any much about him Uh, to my knowledge there's really no video of him talking about anything uh personal or otherwise Uh, so a lot of intrigue here uh it's obviously why it's canonical why it's Mm -hmm. gained so much interest um, but hopefully we'll know some more before too long. We do know that recently he uh, did re- refused to uh, plea anything, so it was automatically a plea of not guilty. Uh, so that's the last update we have on it. Yeah, I mean he's he's retained uh, a capable defense team, so that's another reason I think this case remains high profile because mm. there's going to be a, almost certainly a trial. Yeah, this isn't really a a plead guilty case is looking at death penalty unless they take the death penalty off the table. I don't see how that makes sense. Right. So this is, this is going to be a showdown in court. And at this point, it looks like it's going to be a slaughter. Yeah. I, I don't see him uh, being found not guilty right. or even, even having a hung jury. I think this right. is going to be like a, the jury sits down like we're good. <laughs> Ten, it was like a 20 minute thing just to make sure they've had enough snacks or something and yeah, you know the, the difficulty is in finding a jury that hasn't heard of the case right that's true um and that's happened in a lot of other high profile cases right. you get a lot of news coverage and it taints the jury pool um and i think that might be something that the, the uh, strategy that the defense tries at least if it ends up going to appeal I mean, there's so much circumstantial evidence. Yes. We can tangle things up in court and make right. this. You know, you know, maybe maybe the strategy is you know, we put up such a fight, you know, take the death penalty off the table, mm-hmm. and and plead guilty, right? You know, and life in prison. I mean, that's that's his best hope mm-hmm. at this point. I think. Right. And the 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 only other strategy might be pointing the finger at somebody else who had access to his car, and access to his his K bar, or the, or or the. The whatever sheath. knife was whatever was knife used, we, yeah. whatever knife we use the, the the sheath was one that's commonly found with K bar knives, um, which is a big military knife. The Marine very Marines very very it. very popular since World War II. Yeah, um, long, very sharp. Uh, used primarily, you know, in combat, but also with uh, utilitarian purposes. As it's a bit thicker. Yeah, it's uh, fixed. It's not. It's not retractable. So it's like it's yeah. a serious. It's a serious weapon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, but it also can be used as a hunting knife, or mm-hmm. or yeah, because the thing can be used to chop through small small branches and things like that. Um, but that knife, like if he said, like if I that knife was in the sheath and somebody else had, had access to it, and they also had access to my car, that explains the DNA. That on explains the sheath. why his DNA is on the sheath. But there's like nothing else that ties him there other than the 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 description of bushy eyebrows. Mm-hmm. There's nothing else really that puts puts him specifically in. Right. Well, then, then there's the behavior. Be. Then there's the behavior with the gloves, right? And the and the putting the trash away. But maybe he can argue. Well, somebody took my car, and I realized they must have been the killer. So I was trying to, you know, keep my DNA away. Yeah, I mean, or, a, or he just goes with the. I was sick. I thought I had COVID, so I was trying to keep that away from my family. So anything I touched or used or ingested, I think I was trying to secure that so that it didn't get water droplets anywhere else. Mm-hmm. That's a that's a, a a thing that could be argued. To, yeah. to help with that circumstance. 
on the whole of it, it doesn't look good. No. no. <laughs> it does not look good. And his cell phone was placed That's, in that area. Yeah. Uh, 12, yeah. I think 12 times in the months prior, multiple times before and after the murders. And of course, right. and then it went dark. And then it went dark during the during time. The <laughs> so of course, one could argue: Well, his phone may not have been on him. In reality, who in 2022 does not have their phone on them at all times, if they're driving, if mm-hmm. they're going places? So it could be. Yeah, it's possible. So somebody took but, his phone, but then they were considerate and they're like, "I don't want this guy to get tied up in this murder, so let me turn this <laughs> off." <laughs> It's a it's a tough sell. Oh no, my phone died, and then they put it on the charger in the car. <laughs> They're just so it. considerate. Like, that came yeah. and it turned came back on. No, like that's the thing. Uh, if I've seen in other cases where the cell phone going dark for a period of time has been one of those pieces of evidence because you 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 have. We'll look back at the history, okay? If if your phone does go dark and go inactive completely and it's like shut off every night from like 11 o'clock until 7 o'clock, then you present a pattern. And if it goes off at that time during the time of murder, it's not suspicious. But when you got activity going on with your phone, like notifications coming in, emails coming in, things going on, which they can tell by just by looking at the phone activity uh, – if that's happening all the time, and then just during the time period that you're that, that this murder happened, it goes completely dark, and there's no activity whatsoever, mm-hmm. and then it picks up shortly after, yeah. that's out of pattern. Yeah. That's out of the normal usage pattern, and that's what becomes a point of evidence. And I, I think that's kind of what, what the prosecutors and investigators are looking at with Brian. It's like, we know it went in that direction and went over there, and then went out completely. And then it came back on mm-hmm. afterwards, and then we can we can track it from there. But in the previous the previous times that it had gone down there, it didn't shut off and go completely dark. It didn't yeah. like airplane mode or or take the turn the power off mm-hmm. at the time. He just it became he was there. It was on. It was active. And then sure. just during that time period, it's inactive. Mm-hmm. It does it doesn't look good for him. No. Like uh, they they. By taking these cell phones, like we can take these cell phones, they can plug them into a computer, they can tell exactly how many times the screen's been turned on and how many times the screen's become active and bright in a, any given time period. There, even, was, there was a young man- Even the tilt. Right. Yeah. Even, there was a young man uh, who recently was convicted of killing his parents because the process, based on partially on that, the prosecutors were saying that he was moving through his house using his phone kind of as a flashlight and kept turning the screen on. Uh, now- it could have been that notifications were coming in and turning on the, mm-hmm. turning on the screen because it does happen for some people with push mm-hmm. notifications. Uh, but the prosecutor argued that it was being used as a flashlight. So they can tell how many times and, and how frequently that happens just by looking at the phone activity. I, I plug, you plug the phone in the computer and you can tell like everything that's going on with that phone. It's and like they, a little black box in your pocket. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. The more criminals don't like tape their phone to a Roomba or something before they go to, <laughs> like, don't take it with you, right? <laughs> and, and if you turn it off, like, like you said, that looks suspicious mm-hmm. these days. I think in the early days of cell phones, a lot of people turned them off. But, yeah. n- but nowadays, everybody leaves them on. Yeah. So my, my phone never gets turned off. Yeah, so you, you, can't, you can't do that anymore. But mm-hmm. yeah. Well, yeah, so it's really stacked up against them. We talked about the DNA on the knife sheath. Um, it's consistent with the knife that would have been in there. Right. His vehicle was seen entering the area. His cell phone was in is this King Road where the mm-hmm. house is probably going to be demolished soon. They did say it was donated to the university, I believe, and they said they were going to demolish it. Yeah. I don't know if you remember seeing the early pictures, uh, but there were there was blood actually coming over the foundation you could see on the outside. Really? Okay. Yeah. Like that's... I didn't notice that's that. That's something. Yeah. Uh, so like, you know, it hit the floor and presumably you know went to the subfloor yeah. uh, matches like carpet or whatever and then seeped over wow. the foundation and t- down the side of the house the Jeez. outside of the house that that has to be a lot of fluid yeah you think like yeah. that's not you know i don't also think it was like the highest quality house right like i don't think yeah. it was like it wasn't that sealed yeah that's it, it was it was frat house row apparently like the yeah. that that king king's road or at least uh, the few houses in that area um 
there there was a nickname involved. Uh, I don't remember exactly what it was at this point. Please forgive me. But it was like you know frat house area, um, mm-hmm. and they had a lot of parties at that house. There were there were a lot. There's, of there's body cam footage of different interactions. I think there was one with a victim talking about like the police approached her and said basically don't this can't happen again with the noise, and um, and then it happened again the same night with the noise. So they came back and just took all the liquor and poured it out. <laughs> like you can't you can't. It's really noisy. Really, there were, so there were a lot of parties going on there. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people in and out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I know that one of the uh, one of the friends of the victims on on I think it was a it's either a Dateline or Twenty Twenty said like like everyone who came to that house was a friend of somebody who lived there. So there were no strangers ever coming in. I don't I don't buy that. You get a party with a lot of alcohol. They're going to be people that somebody doesn't know coming in and out. And mm-hmm. if somebody who's practiced at kind of being a wall, wallflower sitting in the back is going to be able to meander through. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Kind of check it out and get yeah. an image of it, of the house. Yeah. You're right. yeah. I think at least once, mm-hmm. uh, whoever committed these crimes, if it was Koberger, yeah. uh, meandered through during a party just mm-hmm. to get a layout where things are. Well, you know, I'm, my guess is he he had one. If he did it, uh, he had one target in mind. This was an obsession with with one young woman, mm-hmm. uh, and he yeah he probably knew about where she lived inside the. It's like a three stories, like a basement, right? And a first floor, but it's like stair stepped. There was murders in different places, different levels, right? Of this structure, yeah. uh, floors two and three, two and three had had homicides, right? Yeah, so. We don't know where he came in. I think they suspect floor two. We know that he went out on floor two because the uh, sliding oh, doors yeah. were, I guess, near that room. So floor two had some kind of ground access. Yeah. Yeah, so he came in there or maybe came in the basement mm-hmm. and then he left through the second floor. Right. Yeah. Somebody that, familiar with it. I don't uh, I don't know if this was confirmed or, or unconfirmed at this point. Um, there were at least a rumor that or maybe one of the parents said that Brian had contacted one of the victims on Instagram or something like that. Do you guys know if that was, if it was just a rumor, if it was actually confirmed or anything like that at this point? I don't remember. I don't know. I don't remember. Disposition of that. Yeah. Okay. There were various claims though over time. Like I think um, there was another homicide in Pennsylvania that people were speculating, but had, the police had had nothing to do with right. Brian. And there, there seems like the, where the news stories work is they'll make like a dramatic uh, title. For the story, right? And then when you read it, it's like, oh, this is nothing—a clickbait kind yeah. of clickbait. There was, was one exactly I, the word I was going to use. There was one I read today, and it said "smoking gun" in the Brian Coburg case. I'm like, well, I don't know about this. I feel like more but, reputable sources. But it was a, but it was a knife that was used, not a gun. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they should have said a "smoking knife" or something. <laughs> and then it said, um, it said about some IDs that were in Brian's car, and it's like, oh, great, they're going to tell me. Mm-hmm. whose IDs these were. You read on, it's like, we don't know who the ID, we don't know, the police haven't said who the, whose IDs they are, but if they are one of the victims, then that definitely says it's Brian Cober. <laughs> and it's like, oh, wait a minute. You said this was a smoking gun. You don't even have any evidence in this. And that's it's like, like saying, that's like saying that you, you saw, you know, that the, the camera saw Brian like whispering to his attorney. Right. If he confessed. Right. Well, you don't even know what, <laughs> like, like, how are we jumping to that? Yeah. It's like Brian Koberger leans over, I'd like to have a ham and Swiss for lunch today. <laughs> he, confessed. He, he confessed. He confessed to his lawyer right there. Yeah. You know, there is, of course, there is responsibility of news outlets and websites and everything to have some kind of quality. Of course, that doesn't always happen. You get these clickbait kind of titles. Uh, but it is unfortunate because that's probably how rumors start. So maybe somebody hears something, they see the, t- see the title, and like, no, no, they found IDs in the glove compartment, the glove box, and, and that proves it. It was him, right? Um, but of course, if you read it, you're know, like, oh, this doesn't actually say anything. So it's a shame that that happens. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we use the term clickbait now because uh, it, it's just a, a, a great term for the sensationalized headline that gets you to right. touch on that link. But that's the sensationalized headlines have been for, for <laughs> as long as there have been newspapers. Yes, as long as there's been As long as there's been news out there. As long as, been, like, town criers going through screaming at the top of their lungs. Um, you know, the, the, the TV news is no different. Mm-hmm. It's like, learn about the 10 things that could kill your child tonight at 11. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, I've got to find, what are those 10 things? That, I need to get them out of my house. What, what's, what's going on? Right. And it's like, turns out to be, it's like really things that you really don't want to have in your head. Don't have, don't have arsenic in the house. Right. Don't have, <laughs> don't invite you know, serial killers to live with you. Don't invite serial killers to live next door. Don't, you know, don't right. have, uh, yeah. I think don't Dr. Oz's things. show was, like, was don't have big, Dr. Oz in the house at all. One big like, clickbait, you know, well, Dr. five Dr. Oz things that will, clickbait. that will definitely keep you alive. Until you're a million years old, or you know whatever he says. <laughs> well, he, he, uh, Oz uh, Mehmet, right? His uh -huh. name. Uh, yeah, he promoted. He was basically like a disciple of Oprah Winfrey. Yeah, with the yeah. the pseudo scientific nonsense, just, just like Phil, all the time, just like Phil, just like Phil McGraw. Mm -hmm. you know, Phil McGraw. I don't even like calling him doctor. <laughs> and technically, he is. He is. He, mm -hmm. he earned a PhD. Mm -hmm. He hasn't used it in thirty years. <laughs> but I think he's getting ready to retire. Right. He's, uh, I think this is his last. Good. It's last, yeah. Okay. Well, you know, I have I have mixed feelings on Phil McGraw because he also, you know, <clears throat> he gets a hold of a lot of the stories that are so interesting. Mm -hmm. Like he has characters on there that, you know, I'm interested in. Yeah. But the whole, you know, his whole thing with kind of like trying to make mental health, uh, you know, an avenue to ridicule people, that's not the part that is appealing. Mm -hmm. You know, that that's like, we don't need that. But it has led him to getting those guests. So it's like, right. Um, the, I, he, he is a big draw towards mental health. I mean, th I think it's good that, that he promotes mental health and that there are a lot of people who wouldn't even think about mental health help if it weren't for Phil McGraw, mm -hmm. but he gives it a bad name is a bad reputation. Like, cause people get this expectation of what sh therapy should be like from watching Dr. Like Phil confrontational. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah, like, yeah. no, that's not what therapy is like at all. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, he's also very, very biased. Like, and and I get it. He's going to have personal bias. That's fine. Everybody's got that. But he lets it through very clearly. When you look at the show, he's on the side of one or you know the two people on the one side, and not on the one or two people or whatever That's on the true. other side. Yeah. And, and there's never fairness. Mm. It's, it's very clear. So like, right. if you're on the op, if you're on the opposing side, if you're on the negative side, you know he's always with these people. Like, oh, you're you know what's wrong with you? You know, like. You know, get real and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't win. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But that's the thing; it's not supposed to be about winning in, in therapy. But you can't but win but therapy. He set that up, right? He set right. It up He's, as a competition. He does set it up as a confrontational uh, mm -hmm. issue. But in in reality, family therapy should be collaborative, a collaboration amongst the family. I mean, if anything, it should be a confrontation with the problem issue, not with you know the person involved in the problem. But get get mom, dad, and you know kid on the same side against ADHD or depression, like depression over here, that's the problem issue. Mom, dad, and kid are over here. They've got to face that. They've got to manage it. They've got to do it. And we do the same thing with addiction therapy, uh, treatment as well. Like take addiction and put it over here. And then you, you're over here with your family and all the issues that come up with family. You're all on the same side because you all want the same thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Understand what your real enemy is. Right. The real enemy is over here. But Phil McGraw, would be like, well, your addict is over here, and then the poor family's over here, mm -hmm. and I'm on the poor family side. And it's like, yeah, but you're now just ridiculing somebody who has a disease and an issue and, and that can't help themselves because you're moralizing the drug use. He's reined himself in a bit, I've noticed, as he's has grown older. I think he's he's more careful. Like sometimes he'll he'll talk about like somebody having a disorder and he'll say, instead of saying they have it, now he'll say, well, uh, this disorder should be on the short list. Okay, like he's not, because he, he used to be very direct, and I, and I think he kind of realized you just that's not helpful. Mm. So now he'll say, well, they may have narcissistic personality disorder. This is on the short list. And you know, he's tempered it a little bit. Okay. And also, I noticed when he's done, like basically ridiculing people, he'll usually try to say something nice at the end. You know, like, well, you'll get past this. Yeah, if you've just been hammered for <laughs> thirty minutes by a national television. Um, I remember one time watching an episode about this this guy who was a who I guess his family had accused him of doing something horrible to like a daughter or a stepdaughter, and Phil kind of leans over and he's like, "Just confess to it. Don't worry about the consequences." Really? Like, <laughs> what what good is that going to do? Yeah, really. What was? Oh, now I get it. Now I'll confess. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, like I think didn't Phil McGraw used to be some type of jury consultant or something, right? Yeah. That's where he met Oprah because she was being mm -hmm. sued by, she was being sued by like cattle ranchers or something or, or some, 
Yeah, I've some there, beef, yeah, the beef, there were a lot of lawsuits. I think it was the beef industry. She had said something about beef. Okay. And All I think right. they were coming after her, and that was where Phil McGraw was like trying to help her pick the jury or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, jury selection. I think that's what it was, something like that. And and then uh, she really liked him and started having him on, and then basically made him a multi millionaire. Yeah. Spun yeah. off into its own show. Yeah. I think he makes eighty million a year. Wow. Roughly. Man. There was one I watched. Uh, it was a clip of it. Um, remember the case we did, uh, Summer Wells, the missing yeah. child? Mm -hmm. He had her father, Don, Don Wells, on there. It was Don, right? I believe so. so yeah. yeah. Um, with a uh, body language uh. panel. <laughs> oh. oh, my goodness. And the clip, it, I don't know what the whole thing was. I imagine it was much of the same. But the clip that I saw was very much, uh, very much what you are saying, Dr. Grande, very much... All of them against right. Don. Right. And they were saying, there, it was the weirdest thing. There was some kind of a backcountry um, gang or something like that that he, they claimed that he knew something about because his body language told them that he respond, reacted to it or something. And it was this whole thing about the panel of people, you know, Don, we know you know something about this. You just got to tell us. And uh, Phil McGraw was kind of, uh, kind of hyping it up. Yeah, Don. Yeah, see, we know you did something. We know you know something. And it was the weirdest dynamic because they were all just at him, and he's sitting there. Uh, who knows if he knows anything about whatever they were talking about. But it was the weirdest thing uh, because it was just them against him on TV, and it was just this dramatic, yeah. strange thing. And what does it have to do with with therapy or counseling? Like, what... It, right. what it, how is that different than Jerry Springer? Yeah. Like, where, like where is the mental not. health piece, yeah. right? It's not. But I, actually, it's, I like Jerry Springer better because at least he was honest about it, what he was doing. He did. At least, at least he leaned into it. Like, for a while there at the beginning, it was kind of like, we're just like all of the other daytime talk shows. We're just like Maury Povich and, and we're just like Ricky Lake and, and, and Sally Jesse Raphael. We're the same kind just of like thing. Just flying and, in the... And a, yeah, yeah. So much, so much worse on the Jerry Springer show. But then he's kind of leaned into it. He's like, okay, this is a circus, so we're going to make it a circus. I'm just going to have all of the circus people come on. Oh and gosh. It's going to be fine. And, you know, just make sure the chairs are bolted down and, and – um, and we'll get the security guards. And we got the lawsuit about the stuff, about the stuff going on. So we got to have the security guards. Um, so Steve Wilkos was on, on there yeah. for a while as the, as the head security guy, just jumping in before they could become, you know, a brawl. And then Steve Wilkos got his own show. I watched uh, a bunch of those episodes for for a video I did on Jerry Springer, and the the security, you know, air quotes. They you would see like the the people would come at each other, and they're like. I'm gonna get you, you know. And the security's like, like this. Like they're not. They can see that they're approaching, and they just sit here like this instead of actually, mm -hmm. uh, like intervening. Right. And then they let them fight a bit, and then they're like, okay, now we'll. Yeah. We'll they, pretend. Let them, they let them make contact and start throwing, and then they get in the middle. And you ever and see those things apart, yeah. like down in I think it happened in Rehoboth Beach, and like Ocean City, Maryland. Those games in the uh, the arcades where there's like a toy or a stuffed animal and the claw comes down claw it was also featured in toy story yeah mm -hmm. uh, the, the claw, claw. the yeah. claw well you notice like that claw is always like it's trying to get whatever and it's like just sli it's like yeah. there's no Slip grip right to it. it right that's yeah. the that's the jerry springer security <laughs> like i'm i'm desperately trying to grab you <laughs> you are safe you. now yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i can't get a grip on you i don't know why uh, uh going back to like the whole thing about the body language experts and everything like that all kind of that that whole thing so especially like the micro expressions stuff i mean like micro expressions are a real thing but but it was a uh paul ekman in the 90s who came up with the whole like micro expressions can help us read people's and tell the tr you know the truth like he tried to convince people that he could uh train the fbi to uh fbi agents to be able to be human lie detectors right through micro, through just through mm -hmm. micro expressions. If I teach you these micro expressions, all of these things mean the same thing. So it, you can tell when somebody's lying. And you know what? The actual lie detector is better. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and we know the polygraph is, is terrible when it comes to being able to determine, you know, truth and falsehood. But uh, it has a better track record than the micro expression um, truth telling. They tried to use uh, them. TSA, I think, tried to use them, like to see if, like. Who who was trying to bring a bomb on or whatever you know like the, like, I mean what would you do with that information if you did suspect like if you looked at a person you're like I think your micro expressions mean you're 
you're going to blow this plane up and you search the person and there's nothing. I mean, it doesn't make sense. Like yeah. uh, they search everybody now. So <laughs> I don't, I, maybe, maybe it was like extra attention, like, you know, based on T micro. TSA is another one of those things that, that, that it, uh, it's unnecessary. It's theater. Right? TSA is just theater. Right? Like it makes people feel a little bit more secure, but it also takes up more time. Cause you know how many terrorists TSA has actually caught since 9-11? None. Well, they don't walk in with, Zero. you know, they're not going to walk through that. Yeah. But they, you know, people do uh, try to bring in like Leatherman tools, pocket mm -hmm. knives, mm -hmm. occasionally guns, and they get like the whole stacks, like the, the airports collect whole stacks of those. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thing. Yeah. Not so much guns, like every now and then a gun, but they have tons of knives and stuff. I think they actually like sell them. Yeah. Like, they'll wholesale they them. Right. Yeah. But like, you know, get a, get a cheap Leatherman from, from some guy who forgot to... Right. Take yeah. it out of the, the some guy I forgot to yeah I got, I got one on my you know on my app I, I would not take it with me to the airport mm -hmm. I I remember there there was a time when air travel in the in the in the world and just in this country was kind of it was a thing like people would you know mostly business people you dress up in your suit and right. and mm -hmm. you know and a lot of people looking fancy going on airplanes sometimes it was an like experience right they mm -hmm. had full on delivered meals not just little trays. Uh, and it's kind of slowly different. But at this point, I feel like like most people go to the airport dressed as like hobos. Because, <laughs> right, like they want you to take off your belt. Like yeah. if I'm wearing sweatpants, I don't have to take off my belt. So right. I'm just going to wear my sweatpants. You know, and some, people are, flops. some yeah. people are like pajama pants. I got to take off my shoes on my side, you know, and, my, and, and my belts and something like that just to go through it. And I'm just going to wear flip flops or right. sandals or, you know, sweatpants. So like, I'm going in, like, I'm just going to pack all my stuff in, in a, in a you know, handkerchief and put it on a <laughs> stick. And that's my bindle just walking in. I'm going to hobo through the, through the airport, you know, kind of hop the train. <laughs> Yeah, onto you just the plane, wear yeah. ripped clothing or something. Right. That way, they just see there's nothing. I got nothing on me. It's all transparent ripped. clothing. I got nothing. There's the new. There's a new. Uh, the new TSA. Line. We can start a quick check. <laughs> transparent clothing. <laughs> no secrets here. This is this is just be just motto. for use just for use at the airport. No secrets here. <laughs> no secrets. <laughs> the boot the new boutique line yeah. from whomever. Oh God. Um, the new Bella Grande line. <laughs> Uh, we'll release the movie first, the uh, Cocaine Bear cocaine movie, bear. And, and then <laughs> cocaine the, bear the TSA line of transparent clothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll be a hit. Everyone will love it. Yeah, just Cocaine Bear fifty five. Yeah, <laughs> didn't uh, didn't I think it was a BMW had a <clears throat> like a car they they had exhibition for recently that could change colors. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe the clothing is, is opaque. There you go. But you have like a you know a button. Oh yeah, yeah they got they got window stuff, <laughs> window coverings like that. Like you put a small electric charge, it becomes opaque. Yeah, right. And then That's when, a good when idea. you turn all the clothing out of that, when you take the electric charge off, it goes it becomes trans, uh, transparent again. <laughs> so the TSA guy comes out, right? And he's like, "I'm gonna I'm gonna have to patch you down. It's an like, extra special dude, thing. Nothing. <laughs> I, I I can beat that. I'll Bam. do you one better. <laughs> That's right." <laughs> Do you even better? <laughs> I got nothing. As soon as you press the button, that's when the slogan comes out. No secrets here. <laughs> uh, I can relate this, of course, to uh, Airplane One, I think. I don't know if it was in two or not, but they go through the X-ray machine, and uh, one woman goes through and totally naked going through this machine, and the guy's looking at, you know, looking back at the, and then somebody walks through with this bazooka and the machine guns and just letting them through. <laughs> Was it uh, in one of those? Was it Sonny Bono? Yeah, it was the a, second, it was one. second one. Yeah. But he, he got the bomb after he got there. I'll yeah. take, I'll take, uh, I'll take the one. second bomb on the second left. Bomb on the left. Yeah, that, was, that was the second one. Yeah. <laughs> after he ordered like a magazine or something like that. Yeah, yeah something like that. <laughs> I'll have the, uh, the High Life, uh, uh, a uh, candy bar, and uh, the second bomb on the left. <laughs> oh, this one? Yeah. Right after that, there was the guy, that the, the tourist, and he had so many things hanging around his neck. You know, the... Um, uh, camera and uh passport and all kinds of stuff and his wife comes over and puts one more thing and he just falls over <laughs> oh, the boy. airport the airport is a special place um yeah. in general it's just you guys ever special. been taking a flight out of or to the newcastle delaware airport the wilmington uh, yeah. I've, I've been to wilmington uh, frontier airport. used to fly out of there right so now they have a velo yeah, yeah it was frontier yeah, and then now they have a velo uh, I don't know if I'm saying that a right. Very small terminal. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's wild because you you go right down on the tarmac or whatever, uh, not through a you know. Oh, you get you go up the, the the steps right or or no, there's a jetway now, right? There, there no, there at least the one we went on. There may be something different. Oh, now, it's the steps. Yeah, 
mean, just go right off the plane, right onto the tarmac, the right, pavement. Yeah, right on the tarmac. Okay. Um, and they have this little coned off section. Here's the section you walk in, but you're you're on the runway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's wild. And then they, you see them bring the bags to this one side, and they just push them over on the other side, just like right on the other side of the wall. Yep. And you're like, wow, incredibly transparent here. I love it. Yeah. Like many, it so many, many fast. years ago, many many years ago, I did take a flight out of out of Newcastle County Airport. Um, it was it was a, a prop plane. Yeah, and uh, the the it wasn't you don't have a, the the stair truck driving up right. to it. It just has the stairs. They just fold down the door uh -huh. to, and walk up the stairs <laughs> into the plane. But yeah, it was it's like wild. five steps from the door in the yeah. terminal. Right. Like you sat there for like five, fifteen minutes, and the guy behind the counter is like, "You want some coffee?" <laughs> the coffee machine's over here. <laughs> just you and me in here. Yeah, right we're now. just just the two of us <laughs> hanging out. <laughs> I'll be your pilot this evening. <laughs> That's right. I'll be pilot. TSA. I'll be, uh, right, I'll bring some food for you if you want. I'll be security. Uh, I'll be the air marshal. I'll be everybody on this plane. Yeah. No, but it. Uh, he wasn't actually the pilot. Mm, he could have been. He could have been. I'm sure he could have been. <laughs> like uh, a lot of people who work at the at the our civil air patrol. Uh, a lot of pilots. Uh, do a lot of different things there, but uh, the the plane was came from another airport. Stopped, picked up more passengers. Well, passenger, because I was the only one there. Um, but there were like five, five or six people on the plane. And I remember clearly as we were, we were we hit some turbulence at one point. The lady was sitting next to me. Was just like started freaking out. Uh, yeah. It was like, if you want to hold my hand, go ahead. Oh, squeeze as nice. hard as you want. I have no feeling in this hand anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. And she took advantage of that. I mean, Oh, that was nice of you, Mike. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Friendly. That was well before I was going to be a counselor. That was another thing I was going to do with my life. I was just going to ride planes and let people and hold my hands. hands. <laughs> Maybe 25 cents for the first few minutes. <laughs> like a taxi. Right. Two ninety nine for the first minute. A dollar ninety nine for each additional minute. I take cash, credit, <laughs> check. Uh, if only we had Venmo at the time. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. I know that was well before that. That was before the smartphones in the ancient days. The before times. <laughs> I'm not sure how we got on the topic of airplanes from yeah, Hoburger. Man. We went far. <coughs> oh, we, yeah, we, we, did, we did go pretty that was far. A, that was a pretty did, good uh, tangent. It was like a multi-tangent. It was. Multi-tiered, multi yeah. It was incredible. If oh, you it, stuck... went, it went through TSA, um, but it, but through like the FBI and lie detectors. And then, ah, there right. you go. Security. There you go. If you've security stuck with us this far, yeah. thank you. <laughs> if you've stuck with us this far. we got a it. true we do fan. Come, come back around at Coburger at some point, <laughs> you know, but security is a very important thing. Yes, yes. Even for food trucks. Even for food trucks, mm -hmm. right? Right. Could have been a job. Could have been. Could have been. One time we should come back from the topic to a completely different murder case. <laughs> right. As if as if it was like this is what you know, yeah, Betty so Broderick. Yeah, Ted, speaking Ted, of Betty Broderick and airplanes. <laughs> <laughs> what? Wait, I thought I was watching. Like, let's, <laughs> what let's just happened? Back, let's come back around to the topic at hand, and that was Ted Bundy. <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> we could call it the mystery part. <laughs> and the mystery is what we're gonna talk about. <laughs> That's every episode. <laughs> If tangents was too stable for you, <laughs> welcome to mysteries. <laughs> where you, there's not even any rhyme or reason to what we're talking we about. We don't even know what we're going to start with. Uh, we never know what we're going to start That's with. True. <laughs> <sighs> oh, uh, man. So, Brian Koberger, bad, right? That's where we are. That's, that's, that's moral kind story. of what we're getting. That's kind of what we're getting. Although, technically, presumptive of innocence. That's right. It's presumed right, innocence. Right yeah. now, right. he has not been convicted of anything. He mm. is still in holding, he is in jail because um, I haven't set bail. Uh, or anything like that. Uh, he he uh, refused to speak. He stands silent, uh, which apparently is a, a rule in Idaho uh, that you get something you can do. Mm -hmm. And here we stand with that. Yeah. But there was all sorts of stuff leading up to that, uh, to to him being caught. Mm -hmm. That that yeah. before he was identified, uh, like I said at the beginning, the internet went crazy with this right, case. Right. A lot of conspiracy theories, false accusations, people accused people who had nothing to do with it, and yeah. law, lawsuits. Everybody and, looking at, at, uh, at what, are, what footage was available and everything, tracking movements of, of the victims mm -hmm, and right. and uh, things like that. They, they know a couple of the girls were, were out at a club and then they, they went to a food truck and got mm -hmm. food. And there was some guy, some poor guy at a, at a food truck just standing in the background. Uh, Everybody in the internet was just like, it's him. It's a killer. It must be him. He's just wearing a white hat. He was a white hat. 
It's just in the background. Like, that's the guy. And it's like, that's the guy. That's the killer. He saw them then, and he and they walk off, and he follows. <laughs> and he's the killer. We got him. We nailed him. Imagine that, if you get the whole internet behind one thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's tough to do. Mm-hmm. Get a lot of people convinced on the internet at one thing. That's tough. Yeah. It is, but everybody on the internet saw so the guy in a hat and went, that's the killer. That's the guy. Spoiler alert. He wasn't the guy. Mm-mm. As far as we know. Mm-mm. Anything Unless he had access to uh, the 2015 Elantra. Right. And, and Brian's phone. <laughs> Brian's phone. <laughs> and the K-Bar. And, and the, right. Or at least the K-Bar sheath. Because mm-hmm. it could have been a different knife use. Um, we can make our own conspiracy theory. Yeah. And it seems strange that a killer would, would leave a sheath behind. Yeah. But the murder weapon, as far as I know, was not recovered. It's not any of the court documents. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and you think they would mention that right? Um, if they had it before. It does seem kind of odd to me that that, that, that got left behind. If, if you have a sheath and, you got a, and you're bringing a knife, why, why not put it on your belt? Yeah. Right? Then there's no chance of dropping the sheath. <laughs> he was wearing sweatpants. He just went through TSA. Yeah, that could be it. Yeah. It could be it. He had to keep it in, in the sheath. Right. Uh, no belt. He's wearing this up, this sweatpants. No yeah. belt. <laughs> yeah. So my guess is he put it. He put it in his pocket, right? I guess this is the theory. He put it in his pocket. He pulled it out. Pulled the the knife out of the sheath. Right. And it was two, you know, two hands. You know, for whatever reason, like stabbing, and then the other hand, like the sheath. Or he put it back in his pocket, and during the struggle, it like popped out. Mm-hmm. But it seems odd. Yeah. And and that fuels the conspiracy theory. It's like, well, how convenient his DNA is on there. And it was left right there. I mean, I can understand. Like, he, he was a criminology student. And I can understand. If if he did it and he wanted to use some of the stuff he learned, getting a hold of something like um, the surgical scrubs that, that uh, they use in uh, uh, the sterile field, the stuff like you walk in and then tie it around behind your back, mm-hmm. that's going to help a lot in keeping your DNA off, especially if you have gloves on over top of that. And if you were wearing something like that, like the surgical apron, and like pulled the knife out and then tried to put it back, like he's completely covered. Like where's the sheath going? I think I might have it tucked in, in the back of my pants and then mm-hmm. you move wrong. Boop. Mm-hmm. It's, it's popping out yeah. and it's there. But that would be why, you know, if he, he's not going to put it on his belt because if he's going to have this thing on, that's going to help keep his DNA from getting anywhere. Because that's the only DNA they found in the house was on that sheath. That, that seems weird, right? Like, he, he, he allegedly murdered four people, obviously at close range. It was a mm-hmm. knife attack. And usually when, you know, <clears throat> when you have defensive wounds, like when you see defensive wounds on victims, the perpetrator... It's gonna be injured a little bit too. Like their their hands gonna overrun the knife. Right. I think this one might have had a guard on it because the K bars mm-hmm. they have a little guard. But it's still it's still gonna get messed up. Mm-hmm. You're gonna get scratched. Yeah. But it, there was nothing. If they were all killed in their sleep, that'd be different. But he was he was fighting them, and the only DNA is on something that he supposedly left mm. behind. Yeah. The only DNA we know of. Right. Yeah, the only DNA that the investigators were able to to discover. Right. Unless maybe they have some on their, maybe the fingernails of the victims. Maybe well, they're that's why. I th- that's why I think if, if if you know if he did it or whoever did it may have covered up. Like mean, we go in covered up in, in in something that's going to be a little, at least a little bit resistant to that kind of thing. There's not going to be any scratches on him. I mean, there were some on his face uh, when he was arrested, but there might not have been anything under fingernails to get. That's true. There's, there's no guarantee that any of those scratches came from the interactions that were going on. He was wearing a mask. We know that. So he came prepared. He was thinking he was going to do something he didn't want to be identified. Although they were able to see the eyebrows. So how good was the mask? Well, the standard ski mask will cover here and here, and you see the eyebrows. It must have just been really bushy eyebrows, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If they weren't, I don't know. Yeah. Super bushy eyebrows. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's such an odd yeah. crime, right? Uh, if you compare it to, so Ted Bundy, Ted Bundy uh, attacked uh, a sorority house, I believe it was. And I think it was, and it was somewhere in Florida, was it Tallahassee? I'm not sure where it was, uh, but I, I, a while back, made a video on it. It's a, it's a really famous attack. It's, it's, mm-hmm, his, mm-hmm. Uh, it's really the one where, you know, a lot of people view that case, like that's where he just kind of completely gave up on um, trying to avoid getting caught. 
Like he actually did escape from that, but some he got caught later after committing another murder. But that was kind of like, I'm going to Florida, and the heck with it. You know, I'm just going to do what I want. And they you can't know, catch me anyway. Was that? They can't catch me anyway. Right. Well, I, I think he just. I mean, some people think he selected Florida because they had the death penalty and they were active using it during that time period. Mm-hmm. Like they were, they were big on that. But you know, it was an it was an odd location considering he had escaped from jail in like Colorado, <laughs> right? He he could have gone anywhere. He ended up in various places, but he decided to do this in uh, in I, th- I think it was Tallahassee. Uh, but but either way, he had gone to like. I think it was a bar or something, and he had seen the victims in advance. And then he went into the sorority house. Of course, the, the lock was broken. That's always the way, right? To, mm. Like, when are we going to fix that? Oh, don't worry about it. You know, yeah, we'll uh, get to it. Right. right. And he took like, a log or something, and he broke you know, the door in, and then he attacked uh, several women. I think he killed two and injured two. And then when he left, he went a few blocks away and attacked another person who survived. Mm-hmm. I think it was I think it was five victims altogether and, and two fatalities if I'm not mistaken. But but it was it was similar because you know you had four people attacked and with Coburger, allegedly four people murdered. Right. Right. Well that was people were definitely murdered, but we don't know if Coburger did it. Mm-hmm. And you know with with Bundy you had a tremendous amount of rage. He had planning, like he stalked, and then tremendous rage. Mm-hmm. And with Coburger we see someone who didn't Again, if he did it, didn't leave DNA except on a knife sheath. Right. It's just hard to believe. I don't know if they had they didn't have DNA when Ted Bundy <clears throat> carried that attack up. If they did, it would have been everywhere. Like yeah. that was not. Yeah. You know, Ted Bundy wasn't. Again, he wasn't even trying to get away. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was Tallahassee. It was Tallahassee. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's um, there's pictures of the there's like photographs are taken by like the news when uh, by the media when that attack happened and. I think there was one where there's like a, uh, a young woman looking out of the window of the, of the uh, sorority, like a building. Like a, I don't know if it was a house. I think it was maybe like a, like a squared off, like rectangular type building. But, mm-hmm. but she's looking out and it was like, you know, it was, it was like the, the age of innocence was, was gone. Yeah, it ended. Right. Like it was that, you know, it's just kind of like now we're all afraid. Because yeah. nothing like that, I don't think it ever happened. Yeah, right. Uh, and I think there's this, Part of me wonders if Koberger wasn't going for the same drama, same effect. Yeah, uh, you know there is never seen. there is people there are people saying um, similarity between the murders, between the attacks, uh, and how Brian and Ted Bundy look as well. Similar mm-hmm. facial features. Um, I mean, similar enough. I guess I don't know that there's a real clear resemblance, but enough that people are like, well, did similar things potentially and maybe kind of looks the same too. And it's, it is an odd, uh, association. Um, but you know, it's, it goes back to the internet sleuthing and, and all that kind of stuff that people are trying to look for connections. Yeah. I, th- I think with, um, you know, there'll never be another killer like Ted Bundy. Right. And I think that if you were going to try to emulate one and you were a criminology student and you wanted to pick one, <clears throat> that would be, you know, you don't want to eat people like Dahmer, you know. Yeah. Um, and learning knots is it's difficult yeah. and time consuming, so you don't want to be like BTK. Right, you don't want to go and, and, and ride a bicycle in California, you're not going to be like a Golden State killer. So right. so you end up like, okay, how about Ted Bundy, right? A classic, you know, and what can I do that would be similar to, to the sorority house attack? Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it almost seems like a statement, that's right. true. It's just, yeah. It's just very odd. I, I think I tend to think he was targeting one victim to kill, but it it could also be that this was his, you know, maybe this was his uh perfect crime. Like I was what people are thinking mm-hmm. is trying to commit the perfect crime mm-hmm. or something. Criminology yeah. student who's right. kind of antisocial loner. He's mm-hmm. been studying studying it a long time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um studying uh very much studying serial killers. I mean he had classes that focused on serial killers and antisocial personality disorder, uh, individuals who committed types of cr- those types of crimes. He had to read the book on BTK in one of the one of those classes. Um, so he definitely had a focus and an interest, and uh, an interest in what it felt like. So it seems like he was part of a research study that asked a question like, "How did it feel?" 
when you, you know, mm -hmm. asking offenders who had violent offenses against other people how it felt in the moments before. Yeah, that was in, is that in Pennsylvania when he was still in Pennsylvania? I yes. think so. I think yeah. it was some type of Reddit posting yeah, that, that was he his, had made. That's what his it was. Master, yeah. It was uh, during his master's degree. Yeah. Yeah. And also he picked, uh, he was a security guard. Oh, you're right. Security guard. I forgot about that. We'd, you'd mentioned that before we recorded, yeah. but yeah, he was a security guard, and that's very common for criminals uh, like this type, like that could be a serial, he's not a serial killer technically, even if he's guilty, but like that, they have an interest in law enforcement, like the the application side, not the theory and, and criminology, right. but right. they actually want to like attack people, and, you know, beat people up, things mm -hmm. like that. So if, um, Koberger did apply for a an internship with a, uh, a police organization at one point it was supposed to be about gathering data on mm -hmm. how they how they gather data mm -hmm. um to do that internship to try right. and help figure out how to get better data right, right. but uh, there's a lot of suspicion that he only wanted to get in just to see how they how they knew what they knew mm -hmm. uh, so you could kind of keep tabs on how the sheriff and at a, how the police departments in the area where where this crime occurred were would would be investigating Right. And then also to make inroads with those people yeah. to try and join me, which also would be something that other serial killers have done. BTK did in early, in his early things, he was involved with police mm -hmm. uh, during investigations. Mm. There have been quite uh, a few serial killers that had an interest in, in law enforcement and were actually even police officers at right. times. Uh, it's, I think it's the sensation seeking. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the Golden State Killer was was a police officer. Yeah, for yeah, a short time. That's right. Had, had been, yeah, right, yeah, right. So yeah, not when, it, when he was he was older when he was finally caught because mm -hmm. of the it was the DNA yeah. genealogy right. thing. But yeah. uh, but early yeah, earlier in his career uh, he did that, and there's been a few. So it's interesting though with the mystery of Koberger is you know just assuming for a moment he's guilty, which I'm pretty sure he is. Uh, if he was playing this out carefully. You know, he, he made a lot of mistakes. Mm -hmm. So overconfident? Like, it doesn't make any sense. Right. I mean, the sheath, maybe that was something in the heat of the moment, but the one witness described him walking. Yeah. So if he had that much time, he could have gone back and got the sheath. Like, mm -hmm. he was that calm. And th that's if he knew that the sheath had fallen out of his bed. Yeah, but you if, should check, checklist. Yeah, right? you should have a checklist. Mm -hmm. If you're going to commit a crime like that, I'm not saying anybody should, but if you're going to go through it like that, and you have a checklist, but... Yeah, in the heat of the moment, where's that checklist going to be? Mm -hmm. it, it's going to be out the window. Maybe he maybe dropped that too. Yeah. <laughs> They'll I mean, find it later. Men yeah. Mentally, I'm sure he did. If mm -hmm. he was going through a checklist going into it, you know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. I mean, there's a reason we practice and and practice all sorts of things repeatedly over and over again before we're in the midst of a thing. It's because the brain loses track of things. Mm -hmm. And this isn't the kind of activity that one practices over and over again. Right. Unless one becomes a very successful serial killer, in which case it wouldn't be caught after. Uh, Gary just, Ridgway. Yeah. yeah. That's where, you know, Gary Ridgway got a lot of practice. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he ended up with a lot of practice and was able to get away with it for a very long time. Uh, but going in and murdering four people in their in their house, it's not something you get a lot of practice at. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and so, you know, even even trying to, like, I don't know how you would even figure out how to, how to role play that out mm. without, you know, other people knowing. And part of this would be making sure other people don't know that what you're doing and being able to, to then practice and practice and practice until you can go in and you know, you know, make sure I got the sheath. Okay. I got the sheath. Everything I come in here with, I'm going out mm -hmm. with and before on checklist before I go out the door. And I, I think if it is his statement, um, then four people was the limit and he didn't attack anybody else because well, I got the four. I got my limit. And that's what he's looking to do. And that's it. and that's it. So if I go and kill everybody in the house, I'm I'm off message. Well, that that was a weird component, right? It was a very odd uh, scene to have people, you know, adults especially, survive. You know, there's been other cases where killers have left kids, like infants and stuff. Mm -hmm. But you know, if there's a if there's a witness who can testify, right? Uh, at, you know, you're you're already in it for murder one. <laughs> it's <laughs> yeah, it doesn't really, you know, from a, from it's right, a, it's a right. you know obviously a dark perspective, but it doesn't make sense from that dark perspective to leave anyone alive. Yeah, well, if we're trying to think of the mindset mm -hmm. of somebody that commits crimes, right. yeah, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Right. I mean, of course, you know, um, 
I mean, and the, 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 the white Elantra, like, I understand a lot of people don't think about it in general as you're moving around, but you're, you're caught on camera thousands of times every day, like no matter where you go. Um, and it's the, the time of night that it occurred was what narrowed in on the, on the Elantra. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was seen in the area on video. And then, wait, why is it in this area? Why is it moving at this time of night? There's right. nobody moving around at that time. And if you look where it was captured, it kind of, you, you can plot a course back to where he lived. Uh, and then with the phone data put on top, like right. it removes, it right. removes any doubt I, really. If you really wanted to get, you know, a vehicle that was going to go like completely unnoticed, um, you get like a silver Impala. It's like the most, the number one car like in the United States, other other than maybe an F one fifty. Listen, get, uh, get a white pickup truck with a yellow light on top, right. or put some put some like some construction like logo. Yeah, reflect, reflect nobody, tape on it. yeah, nobody like nobody sees those. Yeah, yeah. Right. And, and like like you get the silver the silver Impala is the number one most stolen car in the United States I, I, because nobody pays any attention to them. It's an unremarkable car. Nobody you know nobody looks at. I mean. You go back to the '60s; the Impala was amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, much, but, much, much better than today. Like a, a yeah. 2000, anywhere between 2000 and 2023, the Impala is just kind of a meh. I don't think they even sell it anymore. Car. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I know they're still on the road. Yeah, I don't. I don't. Yeah. Th I think GM took cars off the off their lineup anymore, just like Ford. I think. I don't know that for sure, but I don't know. Either Everybody way. wants pickups or SUVs, right? Crossovers. Yeah. 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 Nonetheless, you're right. Yeah. I mean, Ford's still got the Mustang. Well, I they're, mean, sedans. They're always going to have this. Yeah. Yeah. Sedans. Yeah. And they've got, they've got the two different types of Mustangs now, right? There's, yeah, there's the, 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 the classic Mustang and then there's the, you know, wannabe Mustang the SUV thing. It that, is, uh, it is fun to drive. I'll tell you that. Um, but it's I don't, not a Mustang. I don't think it deserves the Mustang name. I see what yeah. they're going for. They're trying to, oh, look, it's fast, whatever. And it is, um, it it's, feels different than other EVs. I just test drove one the other day, and it is fun, but it is not the best EV for sure. Overpriced in many regards, not the best range. It's fun, but that's about all it's got. Yeah, and they're just trying—they're trying to beat to the market with some sort of, sure. you know, mm -hmm. uh, EV electric vehicle supercar kind or muscle car, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it just—it doesn't work right now. Yeah, for 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 them, the design they have is. Hideous. <laughs> yeah, it's not. It's, My opinion. Well, I, think, you know, I think it looks all right. They, they, there's four cylinder Mustangs back in the 80s. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, why would you? What's the point of four cylinder Mustang? I don't. I don't get that. But I don't. I don't, I don't know. To don't know. to make it through regulations. I think I, at that point. I am looking forward to to uh, what what Dodge is going to do with the Challenger. I I have a Challenger, and I'm looking forward to the to the uh, hybrid that they're going to do. Mm. They pumped millions of dollars into the the hurricane engine design. They're not just going to give up on that immediately. Yeah. But they're pulling all the V8s. They're not going to do V8s after uh, 24. Mm. Uh, and they're going hybrid. Which I'm looking forward to. Okay. Mm. Interesting I think, times. I think they just came out with the last Camaro model, I believe, as well. Some kind of uh, blacked out something or other. Mm -hmm. And then they'll go... I guess EV with yeah they're probably going Camaro EV, EV if I or hybrid heard it correctly mm -hmm. yeah but it's the wave it's what it's what's going to happen um, yeah. well they're trying different I'm sad to see, uh, sad to see the V8s go but yeah you know eventually we'll be able to say the last of the V8 interceptors like Mad Max yeah. <laughs> right yeah interceptors I th I think that the you know the V8 was always kind of the uh, the pinnacle of reliability. Especially like in the fifties, sixties, and seventies, when that was a huge issue, when cars were just terribly unreliable, the V eight was that like okay, this will probably work for a while. Yeah, <clears throat> and you looked at like V sixes and and fours in line, and and even there are some V fours, but not many. But you looked at the inline fours and the V sixes, and you're like, well, these are small, unproven engines. Yeah, and then over straight, time, you get your straight sixes too. Straight six, yeah, which BMW still, I think, has a, a straight six, but. Yeah, you don't, you don't, um, you didn't think of those as reliable. It's like the V8, but then that kind of changed. Now they're all kind of equally reliable. So the, yeah. uh, I think it's just you know, fuel consumption. Everybody's concerned about. Yeah, but there's nothing yeah. that really sounds like a V8. Like there's no other engine that sounds like a V8. Oh no. How about a W12 
from a Bentley or Rolls Royce. How about, or how about the W16 16. Out, of the, out of the uh, the Sherman, the the, yeah. uh, the Chiron? Oh, the Bugatti, I thought, the, I thought the, the M4 Sherman tank I thought had a had a W engine as well. <laughs> yeah, ridiculous. Yeah, the Sherman tank. Yes. I don't know if it was 16 the, or not, but it was the Sherman uh, tank definitely had a W engine. But the the uh, the Bugatti Veyron and the Cha- and the Chiron both have uh, the W16. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Plus twin turbo or quad turbos, Jeez. it's insanely fast. Yeah, like pushing over twelve hundred horsepower. Jeez. <laughs> and the average Bugatti owner has an income of over four hundred million dollars. Yeah. But yet, a Tesla minivan can probably still, if they if they if they ever come out with one. I still beat it in a yeah. drag race, right? Because the <laughs> torque, <laughs> doubtful. The torque on the on the Chiron, like that. Whew. Is it all wheel drive? Oh yeah. It, yeah. Uh, that, that that thing has a zero to 60, 60 speed of like two point one seconds. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, that, it it is hugely fast. Yeah. It may have to be a Tesla car, probably. Yeah. But, well, yeah. Maybe yeah. The, tes- the Tesla Roadster, maybe. Yeah. But but uh, like even the S class, like the Chiron, would, would blow it off the line. I think the Plaid does one point nine, doesn't it? Plaid's incredible. It's an incredible, incredible vehicle. I'd never want one, but yeah, I'm just. But you know, it. you know what I think is even better is the DeLorean, the new DeLorean. <laughs> the new DeLorean. Oh, jeez, yeah, I forgot oh, yeah. about the new one. The new yeah. DeLorean coming out, fully electric. That thing's gonna be awesome. When's that, when is that coming out? Uh, I think that they came out this year. Did they already? Uh, okay. I think the first the first set, but they're okay. incredibly expensive. Oh yeah. Um, but they do have a zero to eighty-eight speed of <laughs> four point two seconds. Wow, fast! <laughs> that was the uh, much my favorite. Th- my favorite thing. Yeah. In yeah. the stats, I was looking at the new Delorean website. I was just looking at it. Actually, it doesn't have a zero to sixty speed or a zero to hundred speed. It has a zero to eighty-eight speed. <laughs> I was like, if you're gonna market the Delorean, you got to do it. That that's way. one of the best things to put yeah, on that. Awesome. You got to go back to the future for that. You've got to. <laughs> Not so, so still Brian, got the gold wing doors. So, if Brian drove a, a DeLorean, that would not have been a good tactic. Well, no, if he'd uh, driven a DeLorean, he probably wouldn't have gotten caught because he'd just go back in time. Yeah, that's true. Tried a few more times. Just get yeah, it right. Just go back in time. Go get the sheath. Mm-hmm. As long as you don't run into yourself <laughs> committing the murders, <laughs> you're fine. But, you know, oh, you'd already know what's going on. Mm-hmm. Just grab the sheath, get in the car, take off. You know, I'm surprised that uh, more, not that the you know, we don't want more murders, of course, but I'm surprised that more killers didn't pick up on what the Golden State Golden State Killer did with the bicycle. Right? He'd pick houses where there's like a bicycle path yeah. behind it. Yeah. So even if the police showed up, I don't know if they ever did because he was always actually pretty good at containing things. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, he'd sneak in, do what he did, right? He'd he'd ride out through the path. So even if the police showed up, they would be on foot because they can't yeah. drive through trees. Yeah. And he'd be. You know, he'd take his bicycle to the car or whatever he had and, and be gone. Uh, where this uh, the other house thing, is located, Coburger could have used a bicycle or an e-bike. The other thing he did was, like, they, they went, went near um, where they had the paved-in um, river and, or uh, streams. Like, when it's paved, he could ride the bike through the paved mm-hmm. area and then just kind of ride up the thing right into a backyard, set the bike down, go in. Do the thing. That is, honestly, the Golden State Killer is the most terrifying killer to me, yeah. in my opinion, just because his victims were so random. And mm-hmm. it wasn't just like, oh, I'm on the street, I get into an altercation. It was, oh, I'm going to go to that house today. Yeah. And he escalated. Like, he, 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 he graduated to murder, and then he kept murdering. You know, so there's a slow, pretty slow progression. He had a long career. Uh, yeah, horrifying. He was a horrifying killer. And he, and he left a lot of California in fear for a long yeah, time. People right. talk about Ramirez. Right. Well, Ramirez was like basically like one summer. Bad, yeah. you know, but yeah, for bad. most part, it was contained to a few months. But uh, Golden State Killer had a very long yeah, career. He did. And uh, would, would, again, once he was in houses, like he'd take a woman into, into another room. Mm-hmm. And then he'd, he'd have the woman tie, tie up the guy. Right, mm-hmm. right. And then this is the most ingenious thing. Like he'd go to the kitchen and grab a stack of plates and put oh. it on the on the guy's back. If I hear these plates, I'm call, uh, you know I'm killing her. And they take her off into the other room mm-hmm. and do whatever. Um, but like that's genius. Like that's an, that's an alarm system right there that, yeah. that's going to deter that guy from trying to move, trying to break out of his box. Because if he moves too much trying to break the break the whatever's tying him up, the plates are going to fall. Yeah, and that's going to be heard. Mm-hmm. You know, and that was it was it was just, it's just terrifying. Like it that was is, yeah. he yeah. did a, and he called 
victims mm -hmm. for years afterwards right. is right. terrorizing right. them. Right. I mean, uh, and really adding to the yeah the, the ones the ones that live trauma the ones that lived he'd just keep calling him right. over and over again and uh yeah he was he was he was a uh, he was sick and he really was. to me he's the most terrifying just because of how random he was he just pick random houses and mm -hmm. go in and do his thing yeah uh, he'd also he'd also pick victims from the street like walking up right. like yeah he just never know what he was going to do right yeah um, and he and he traveled over a fairly wide geographic area uh -huh. in California and moved a few times like it's just yeah. Very tough to, you know, they didn't know really what crimes to attribute to him even in the beginning. Like, I don't even know what he did. Right. Mm -hmm. Was it two? Was it three? Like, how many people committed these, right. like, ten offenses? Right. You, you thought it was the same person, but, yeah. yeah. You know, it, thankfully, <clears throat> obviously this has downsides, but thankfully now we have cameras in so many places. Mm -hmm. The people's doors, the, you know, but um, uh, cameras on the, on the d uh, doorbells and everything. Uh, as well as cameras, lots of other places. So even if somebody did that today, there's a good chance that they'd be caught in camera and, and maybe found a little bit quicker. And even if Brian Koberger were to, or whoever did this, were to ride a bike or something like that, maybe there's a good chance that he'd be caught on camera and we'd be able to see his face instead of just image of the car. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, he wasn't, wasn't terribly smart about a lot of things. Um, but to the advantage, I guess, of the victims and their family, because then they were able to find the car and ultimately find him. But, um, yeah, maybe if he was going for the perfect murder, he didn't do a good job at that. Yeah, and I mean, I guess the, the, the Elantra is not a super noticeable car either. <clears throat> um, but it, it was noticed because of where it was. And how uh, early it was, too. And how early in the not morning a lot of people, it was, yeah. Especially in a college town. People would be out late. But between, I don't know, maybe between the hours of like two and sometime earlier in the early in the morning. Uh, I mean, you know, I think late morning. I think if he if he'd thought things through, right? If if you think things through on like your escape, and you get like sign up for Lyft and get one of the Lyft, uh, the the lights and put in the, in the dashboard, then if you're driving. You have the Lyft light on, and you're driving. It, that's going to get caught on camera. Then you get dismissed immediately. Why is that car so? Oh, it's just a Lyft. Mm-hmm. That's, that's the thing that, that drew attention to the car was that it was in, in a place where there you know, wasn't a lot of traffic. But if it had a Lyft logo on it, if it, if it was, you know, then, be like, oh, it's out that late because, oh, it was party night. And it was a Saturday night. Mm -hmm. It was the last home game of the, um, in the, uh, the, the university. Uh, not Washington University, but the, the Vandals. Yeah, yeah. Um, Idaho. Uh, it was their last home game. They lost, but uh, apparently one of the the uh, slogans of the of the Vandal fans was "Win or lose, there's still booze." <laughs> so there was a lot of partying. Yeah, there was a lot of drinking uh, yeah. afterwards. So it, it, having a lift a lift sticker or lift light in the car would have, like, that's a, ca that's a camo right there. Yeah, it's camouflage, yeah. That's a camo camouflage right there, because people are just going to be like, they're not going to be like, well, what's that car doing there? It's like, oh, it's a lift. Somebody needed a, needed to go home. Mm -hmm. And so they called this. So somebody was being safe and responsible. Great. Um, but it gets dismissed immediately. It's one of those ways of blending into the background. But Koberger, if, he, if that was his Elantra and he was driving it, didn't think about that or that kind of thing. It was just a, like, nobody will notice me at 5 o'clock in the morning. Nobody will see me. There's so, you know, these days there's just so much that a killer like this has to look out for as far as you know, the DNA, of course, fingerprints, video, the cell phone data. There's mm -hmm. so many things that, that you have to control for. Yeah. I mean, it's not like the 50s when that kind of murder would never have been solved. You know, if, if somebody was even as careful as he was, mm -hmm. I mean, he, he was physically not at the premises when the police arrived. Right. So he was already way ahead of the game and for the, for the 50s technology, mm -hmm. you know. So, uh, yeah, but these days, there's just so many ways to get caught. And you think, okay, well, only a criminology PhD student could figure this out. Oh, wait, oh, a, wait. Second. <laughs> wait a second. <laughs> just, it just seems like a very odd, like, what were you studying? Like, was he not a good student? Mm -hmm. uh, 
Sorry, man. Go ahead. I was just saying that there's a, there is a difference between the, doing the studying and the book work and the actual <laughs> practice, right? right? That's true. He might have had it all down in his head. I'm like, this is the plan. I've got the perfect plan. I get through it, but then execution, things start to fall apart, right? There's a simple thing like make sure I secure the sheath mm-hmm. in my belt or in my back pocket. Is okay. I got it. Doop. Rah, and then the sheath falls out. And then if you look around the room. I don't see it if you're even thinking to look for it at that point because that step's done. I've put it away. Mm-hmm. It's it's done. So it gets lost. Again, you don't get a lot of practice at doing this kind of thing uh, until you become really successful. But he wasn't successful because he didn't have a lot of practice, thankfully. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, his, his first attempt ended up with four people dead. Yeah. Uh, and it, it becomes... Him, if he was the one who did it, he had a great idea for it, a great premise f- for it in his mind, a right. great premise for it. But the the execution is where things fell down. And again, he didn't leave any other DNA behind. Mm-hmm. And he had he had an advantage that that he just could not have expected in that very odd delay. Uh, he committed the murders. He was seen. We, we think right, mm-hmm. an eyewitness, and. They went back to bed. She went back to bed. The witness. It does. It just. Who who could have thought that he was going to get that kind of lead? You know, he probably thought that. Oh, somebody's going to be calling the police, like now. Mm-hmm. But that didn't happen. Uh, yeah. It's just. It's I. It's hard to imagine. I, and I know in the trial, that's probably you know one of the things people are very interested. Like what what was the story with that? Maybe there's a logical explanation. I don't know. I don't know what was going on, but it's. It's bizarre. I mean, just just call the police. Like it's not rocket science, you know. I mean, there is there is an excellent an explanation where someone had taken you know, Ambien or uh, gummies. I don't know. I, I think I'd, uh, marijuana might be legal in Idaho. Um, one of the states, either Idaho or Iowa, decriminalized like everything. Like every sub every substance on the federal list was decriminalized. So. You know, it's not a state crime, but it's still yeah. a federal crime. Re- yeah. Recreational use is is is, uh, is still there, um, but if she you know used something legal that was like a sleep aid or like Delta Nine or Delta Eight or something like that, THC, uh, she could have been in a in a state where there was no fear mm-hmm. or no sense of urgency in that moment because that part of the brain's being blocked off by the substances, and it's just like, oh wow, this is neat. And then they walk out and like, okay, I'm going back to bed. Mm-hmm. You know, weird dream. Could yeah, could it could have been anything? Could have been anything. I, we'll, we'll find out during the trial. But it's just, mm-hmm. it's it's just one of those. You know, thank goodness he didn't kill again. All right. But I mean, that was giving him way too much time. Yeah. The, the, if the police had, I don't know if they would have caught him any quicker, but they would have had a chance if um, he had just fled the scene. Like she could have called. They they probably would have been there in that area. Two minutes. What do they have to do? Right. It's mm-hmm. not. <laughs> it's not that busy. It, um, as probably a very unusual call. They'd be highly interested in responding. Right. Um, and he, uh, or at least the cell phone, was back in the area at some point after that. He could have even um, potentially been associated with that crime scene faster. Right. right. If the police were there, uh, I don't know when he when the cell phone was tracked back there or the car for that matter. But he could have been a Associated with it faster if mm-hmm. if police response had been there, maybe. Yeah, it's critical to call the police when homicide occurs. It's strange that that would be a lesson we'd even have to be discussing. <laughs> like, like, uh, I mean, yeah, who knows uh, their state of mind though? It, still, time. if this person's state of mind was just standing in the hallway, this is a stranger, right? Okay, and especially since it's a party house, there's a lot of parties. There's a lot of people that might be coming through, come out. Oh, this person's leaving. Okay, go into the kitchen, get my water. The murders happen behind closed doors, you know, one floor up or yeah. uh, or, or down. Uh, go and get my water, go back to bed. But I think, uh, I thought I saw a report, I might be wrong, but I thought I saw a report where she had said something about being afraid of him or he was, and wearing all black. Well, she locked the door. Right. She went that, back in her room. That's the part. Like, if she just, if he was just like, look like another fraternity guy, right. you know, a little 
a little old for uh, for that know. house, but okay, twenty eight. I mean, was he twenty eight? Twenty seven at the 27. time. Twenty seven, but yeah. So a little old, but uh, you know, it's only twenty seven can pass for twenty three. There's whatever. still a lot of women who'd be afraid of a frat boy, especially a frat boy right. yeah, on so, a Saturday night. So and, she was she was afraid, and then you know, to so say yeah, she wasn't afraid. I get it. Like you just go back to bed, but she was afraid. She closes the door, knows something's wrong. You think at the least check and see. Everything all right? I just saw this strange right, right. guy that scared me in the house. Mm-hmm. I don't recognize him. He's wearing a mask. Seems kind of homicidal. Yeah. Maybe I should just check. Just uh, that little uh, investigation. The, the, it's it's the seems kind of homicidal thought that might not have hit. Right? <laughs> we would have thought that, right? We'd be like, hey, like, this second. Yeah, but uh, I've you seen know, this oh, before. This guy's this guy's really creepy. He's walking around in my house in and, and, and all black. I'm going to go in my bedroom and lock the door because I don't want him coming after me. Mm-hmm. The thought of, well, maybe he already got somebody else in the house might not come up. Yeah. Well, I would think just for peace of mind. Like, right. so let me go make sure, like, oh, that was probably somebody they knew, but let me just check. She goes over. They're like, oh, yeah, don't worry about it. You know, like, I know, and then it's all done. But, of course, she would have found them not doing that because they were killed. But that's what she's expecting to hear is like, oh, yeah, mm-hmm. no big deal. We, we know who he is. He's a strange guy who wears yeah. a mask and walks through houses. In all dark uh, colors. Big, yeah. bushy eyebrows. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, again, there's the state of mind that uh, potential intoxication. Well, they had been out, I think, right, and on mm-hmm. the town. So who knows yeah. what. There had been a lot of, a lot of substances Im- imbibed. You know, you think, I think some places, like college campuses, the assumption is that if you're going to get hurt, it's going to be another student in the immediate area. Mm-hmm. Right, uh, he was from. I mean, technically, a different state, right? Right. Um, yeah. There's only ten miles difference between was, where where. Yeah. But it wasn't uh, that Idaho and yeah. or Moscow, Idaho, and where the uh, Washington State was. Yeah, but he wasn't somebody you'd expect there to be is. frequenting that particular. Right. You know. Well, actually, one of the things that was said uh, very frequently on on one of the uh, 2020 or Datelines that that I watched recently, I covered it was that. Yeah, they were only separate. They were separated only by ten miles, so it was kind of like one one community. Right. Like there was a lot of crossover between uh, students from WSU and and from Idaho. Like they they crossed they crossed a lot. When it, when I think when it, you know when a place is open like that, <clears throat> and you have a lot of people coming in, and and you do think the threat's going to be probably internal. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're not really worried about an out of state or coming in and Right. Stabbing everyone, right? So locking the doors, having cameras, security system, things like that just don't occur. It just feels safe. Mm-hmm. There is also a bit of the the youthful immortality mm-hmm. right. thinking like that, yeah. especially early college is, is that um, that stage of the second stage of adolescent egocentrism, right? Uh, the, the, the still exploration of myself, but the idea that I could die isn't something that hits most. Mm-hmm. No. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're living, living their best life. Mm-hmm. Not thinking about somebody's going to randomly come into my home and murder me. Right. Like that's, that's, that's thoughts. F- you save those thoughts for when you're in your thirties. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. But, they, they were typical probably for the area. Yeah. yeah. Right. Having the police visit often. Yeah. Getting in some trouble, being disruptive, probably using substances. But I think, you know, I, what, what Koberger, what this case reminds us is that, you, you know, if you want to be safe, if that's a goal, then you have to be safe all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, take precautions everywhere you go and everything you do. Not live in fear, but you have to take, you know, lock yeah. the doors. Right. You have to be responsible. Call the police when you suspect a murder, things like that. Yeah, if, if um, there's some stranger who just came into your house, call the cops. Yeah, and I know it sounds kind of moralistic and preachy, but, the, you know, being intoxicated greatly increases the risk of something like this. It wasn't their fault, but it great. It makes right. you vulnerable. It makes you in a worse position to respond, and um, it just. I, I don't see the attraction. I understand it. <laughs> I get it. Like I get it, but I don't see the attraction mm-hmm. for for anyone who wants to continue to survive. Alcohol is not your friend. Yeah, it's yeah. not. No. Yeah, the interesting part <clears throat> is that uh, one of the women in the house had um, just gotten some kind of food delivered. Um, if I remember correctly, mm-hmm, not right. too long before the murder came in. And, uh, you know, maybe that just wasn't on their mind, locking doors and stuff like that. It's a curious thing, what would have been different if 
maybe if the doors have been locked. Who knows if they actually were or not? I don't mm-hmm. think we know, but um, there's no signs of forced entry or anything. So it's, it it does to your point. <clears throat> it is to your point that um, they they probably weren't really thinking about safety or anything like that. Who knows their mindset at the time? But um, maybe if the door had been locked, maybe something would have been different. Who knows? Maybe we would have never heard about um, Moscow, uh, Idaho at this point. You know? Yeah. But before it's before that, thing. I the only Moscow I knew about was in Russia. Yeah. The, there have been uh, many killers who were discouraged. Like they go out for a night of killing or whatever, and they're discouraged by the first person because they fought back or their doors were locked or they mm-hmm. had a cell phone or they yelled for help, and they go and kill someone who doesn't. Mm-hmm. Or they were sober and, you know, aware and sure. running and fighting. Many, many times that's happened. Uh, killers uh, end up with, if there's no motive, like if it's a specific person they're trying to kill, that's different. Like a husband mm-hmm. trying to kill an ex wife, whatever. But if it's a random thing, right. you don't make yourself an easy target. Yeah. It's, just, it's not worth it. Mm. Because uh, yeah. you never know. Yeah, substances, college students, substances are, are huge with them. But speaking of substances, like Brian Koberger had his issues with substances mm-hmm. oh, that's right. uh, yeah. as well. Early heroin. On right. in life. It was, yeah, marijuana and heroin. Because mm-hmm. um, that goes back into, into his high school time right. period where he was, uh, in, in, in his adolescence, was uh, early in high school very overweight. Mm-hmm. And there are social media posts from from his uh, of his from that time period where he talks about feeling like an outcast and and i i, be, I believe it true i believe it's mm-hmm. true right? that there was at least a certain amount of bullying going on mm-hmm. um uh speaking from my own personal experiences that like kids uh, around that age that we can they pick out differences and you know if you're overweight that's going to be a, tar- mm-hmm. a point of target uh and that feeling can help uh, can help a person feel disassociated from the other people. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And there's a lot of indication that that was what was occurring for him at that time period. Mm-hmm. A lot of the things that he was saying in the social media posts uh, were things like "I feel invisible" or "I feel like I'm I'm an outcast." I feel yeah. like I'm 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 on the outside of things. And you know, if if everyone else is bullying, and again, that's part of that adolescent egocentrism that that trying to discover I'm a unique individual. But nobody else is thinking about me mm-hmm. and feeling separated from everybody else at that time period. Uh, yeah. And earlier, I'm not sure if there was any uh, any earlier trauma than that, but sometimes the bullying, especially if there was physical interaction, uh, that can lead to trauma response. And trauma response often, especially around 14, 15 years old, leads to substance use. Mm-hmm. And then the substance use, because it feels good. I haven't felt good. I haven't felt able to be myself in forever. And I can do that when I'm on drugs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, bullies uh, have created many killers yeah. through the years. Right. You see histories, uh, you know, can be parents like right. mistreating, but also like uh, classmates and right. friends in the neighborhood. And they make that contribution, right? That negative contribution and the killer pays it forward. Mm-hmm. A negative way, right? Like they, so you know, it collects in that person who's targeted, and then they become antisocial. Right. You know, they start to view humanity as uh, as negative, and they don't have empathy. Cobra doesn't look like he has much empathy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, he seems to lack lack empathy in, in in many ways. But again, we haven't spent a lot of time with him. Never yeah. met the man, right? Never met the man. Who knows? Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, he, can't make any diagnoses just based on what we see. Who knows? Yeah, he could be innocent. You never know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, I don't think he is based on what the state is saying. I think the state has a pretty good case. Right. Um, but if he did have a defense, I mean, certainly they would keep, you know, his team would keep that under wraps as mm-hmm. for the trial. No sense giving away the secrets. Right. I think where we get into to things with Koberger's state of mind uh, comes a lot from, from the stand, like after using substances, he went to rehab, but then like lost 100 pounds mm-hmm. uh, before he graduated from high school. I think losing that weight, there was a certain expectation of acceptance. Like, right. Now that I've this lost fix all the this, problem. now that I've lost all this weight and I've kicked the drug problem, mm-hmm. I, I'll, I'll, I'll be accepted by people. And he was trying to connect with people after that. And there was there were there are things that uh, people who knew him um, in uh, when he was first in college 
said one of the people he was in a, uh, one of his science classes with did an interview on date. I think it was the Dateline, and talked about they were they were doing a project and they were trying to get a picture for for this PowerPoint they were doing, and Brian was supposed to be posing for the picture. We kept joking around and kept kept doing things, and then the guy's like, "Seriously, we need to do this," and, and then the guy says well, he just turned off, and just was you know then like immediately straight faced and mm -hmm. and like it, it was. Uh, as he put it, weird. It was mm -hmm. odd that he just managed to, like he turned off the, the playfulness immediately and just stood and posed for the picture and then they took the picture uh, and moved on. But that also can be a trauma reaction, right? The, the whole, like, hey, I'm trying to get your attention. I'm trying to, mm -hmm. you know, I'm trying to have fun. I'm trying to get his acceptance. And then you, you, any kind of like harsh words, like even if it wasn't like harsh, harsh, it was a, it was a, a stop it. Mm -hmm. It was, that becomes rejection, which becomes immediate shutdown mm -hmm. of emotional state, and boom. And then that kind of thing continued. There was one uh, interview with a, a woman who went on a Tinder date with him. I think it was a Tinder. It might have been another another app, but... Right, I think I, I read right. that uh, report. Yeah, there like, was, was a news was, article. Like, it, they went to see a movie, and everything was fine. They went back to... Uh, they, but he, he kept trying to, like touch her but not like as she said not in like an inappropriate way he wasn't trying to grope her or grab her he was just trying to to do like little like tickle stuff and and but and she was it was kind of turned or turned off and when she brought it up and said like why you know please stop doing it, he's like i'm not doing that and like she got out of it by going to the bathroom and pretending to be sick and mm -hmm. staying there and he finally like messaged her said i'm after an hour of her being in the bathroom waited an hour yeah he's like i'm gonna go like Waited an hour. She said, I think I'm going to be sick and went to the bathroom. I'm like, do you want to split the check? <laughs> <laughs> if that was me, I might be asking that question at that moment. But, or, oh my goodness, you're feeling sick? You, you, need, to, you need to go home? Mm -hmm. We can reschedule for some other time if you like. Yeah. If not, you know, it was nice meeting you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It sounds like but, maybe there was a time where he became narcissistic in order to protect his ego. But then when he, uh, you know, he, Moved past the 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 attributes that he thought would be embarrassing, he still had that narcissism, mm -hmm. yeah, that social awkwardness, and he just couldn't he couldn't readjust. Does it just go away? Just right. you know, because he thinks he's attractive or whatever, it's not going to go away. Right, right. And he you know kind of stunted like a stunted development, where he just he never moved past that. And, yeah. and I I think he may have still been searching for who he was, mm -hmm. right, and. You know, studying criminology and studying serial killers and so on, studying all of this stuff, I think like he, when he started recognizing some of himself in the story and in, in the in the subject matter, right? Like started recognizing his, you know, some of the antisocial traits that he was exhibiting himself. Like, hey, I see a lot of myself in this. Maybe this is where the direction I should be going. I'm. This is me. This is my real person. This is yeah. where I'm becoming. Surrendering kind of, to. These kind of, desires he always had. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kind yeah. of a red dragon kind of thing. If you mm -hmm. go back, like he's becoming mm -hmm. something more and he wants he wants to go through that transformation um, because he's seeing himself in what he's studying. Yeah. And you know, that happens with a lot of people when they're studying. But I mean it certainly happened with counseling. I, the more I studied counseling, the more I saw I saw myself as a counselor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, I know he, cer certainly not everyone who studies criminology fancies themselves as a criminal, <laughs> but when someone is feeling that they have been antisocial their entire life, then they start reading about the, you know, anti so what what is success in antisocial personality disorder? Mm -hmm. They're these people. Yeah. And yeah, you know, well, I want to be like those people because, you know, they're my heroes. They become my heroes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that, that that may have been kind of where this was driven from. Usually yeah. when people go to school for the job they want, usually it's not uh, being a criminal or something like that. Usually it's something else. Well, but. imagine going to like firefighter school and empathizing with the fire. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, that's kind of what, you know, maybe he did, right? He's like, well, we had we had the one case with the guy yeah. who was... Uh, uh, John Orr. John Orr. John Orr, right. He was yeah. fascinated with the fire. Yeah. He, he did empathize with the fire. Yeah, he, like did. They, he yeah. wanted to see more of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. He wanted to burn all of... California or whatever, apparently. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, you can you can connect with the wrong part of a study, I guess, you know, the wrong part of a schooling experience. I mean, at this point, the best trade school for criminals is prison. Right? You you want to you want to learn how to be a better criminal? Go to prison. Mm -hmm. 
Well, Sp- spend a couple of years there. You'll he's going to get as, a lot of training. <laughs> spend yeah. a, you'll come out as a better Probably. criminal. <laughs> I don't think he's going to come out, but yeah, uh, normally he would <laughs> if he was shorter sentence than life. Mm. I think I think he's uh, I think this this ends with him going to prison for life probably. Yeah. I don't know if <sighs> death penalty is tricky because even if it's uh, imposed, it can take you, know, you can die of something else by the time it happens. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know how speedy some states are speedy. Like Texas has a reputation. <laughs> I don't yeah. think they really are, but they have a reputation as being speedy. Right. Right. Um, I think in reality they're probably just as slow as everyone, but. I don't... It's the express lane to the electric chair. Go <laughs> <laughs> yeah. to Texas. Well, I think also, you know, Brian is making it clear through his defense that he's going to fight every single step. Right, right. And that's the way to get out of the death penalty is to just, you know, keep the process churning and, and don't ever, you know, mm. concede anything. So he's pretty young now. He's going to have, it's going to be tough. He might actually get executed in his 60s or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like people talk about Lori Vallow, mm-hmm. right? Now she's not facing the death penalty uh, now, but she has to go to Arizona, yeah, where mm-hmm. they have it. I believe they have it. So, but realistically, even if she's convicted, it's never going to happen. Yeah, I, I, I get this. This sometimes these ideas because I'm, I'm a very creative individual. But I'm, I'm thinking like the only defense that might actually work is, is if like there really was somebody else who did it. But it's kind of a like a strangers on a train thing, where like Brian <laughs> actually went and killed some other people over here at right. that exact time. The crisscross, yeah, the crisscross. Cross. Simpsons, right. Simpsons. crisscross, <laughs> right? So like he's over actually over committing these murders and and doing a good job of that. Somebody else was there, but they specifically planted the sheath so that it would be found to try and tie back to him. So that if he gets caught, so that when he gets caught. You can actually find some, you know, there can be some real evidence that shows that he didn't do it. It was somebody else, but you know, they, but they'll never find out who the actual person was because there's no evidence behind that because the investigators stopped looking. Mm-hmm. You know, that'd make a great movie, right? It's it the only thing that could make this case more fascinating. It, yeah, uh, and it, it'd be phenomenal. But and hey, look, I just want to say right now that if it all comes out like that. In, in in reality, you called it. <laughs> I called it, and I was in Delaware at the time. <laughs> I, will, I will point that out. I was in Delaware. Prove it. Nowhere near Idaho, so it wasn't. You weren't wasn't, driving in a mantra the Chris, across the country. Or no, I wasn't the crisscross. It wasn't me. I wasn't on a train. No, no, no straight on a train. Well, now you've got to prove it, man. I mean, <laughs> your cell phone should. No, yeah, right. Yeah, my cell phone. My cell phone oh, never turned, turned it off. off didn't you? No, it's never turned off. <laughs> This thing never never turned off. And I, I take every opportunity to put this on any kind of charger that I can, like wireless chargers. I have wireless, wireless chargers everywhere. Uh, so, like, I'm putting this on a charger, like every time, every chance I get, so it doesn't die. Because I hate it when my phone's dead. Mm-hmm. So it's not going to get turned off. So I have proof on my phone. Mm-hmm. I was here in the state of Delaware at five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> on in we have to adjust for the time difference. Too, That's right? true. Oh, did you think about that? Okay, like? so. Well, that would have been three hours. I probably, no, I, you know what? I might not have been. Oh boy. I might not have been in the state of Delaware. So it's a confession. I would have been in the state of Pennsylvania at that point because it would have been something like eight or nine o'clock in the morning. Albrightsville? <laughs> <laughs> no, not Albrightsville. It would have been Kennett Square. Uh, technically tough Kenneman. Tough Kenneman. Is that, was, that would have been a Saturday. So I think they're three or hours was it behind. A, or was it a Sunday morning? So you might just be lying. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> What time zone is is Idaho? Is that... I, I think somebody said it was uh, Mountain Pacific. I don't know, Pacific. Three, three or four hours. Is it is it is it all the way Pacific? I'm, I'm not, maybe I'm time? wrong on that. I don't know, I but don't it's know. definitely behind. It's either two or three, three hours, hours behind. Yeah, maybe three or four. I don't. Know. I think well, it can't be four. Is I thought there was a part that was four, like way on the west. I might be wrong. Not. I don't think no, I'm like out in Alaska. Alaska be yeah. You could yeah. Go. Okay, but well, I th- fair enough. the Pacific time's three. I think it's three, three back. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Three behind us. Mm-hmm. And at least mm-hmm. it's not in Arizona because then, you know, daylight savings. They don't, they don't honor. Like, they don't. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, Arizona is on a different time than everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thought we were getting rid of daylight savings time, but apparently not. There was actually a case I looked at recently where uh, it was this, it's a pretty famous case. I think it was covered on, on at least one of the uh, like documentary shows. I forget which one, at least one, where a woman helped a guy escape uh, a prison. He got into a box. She was like a dog 
like one of those dog programs. She ran that dog program. Okay. And she he got in the box and prisoners loaded him into the van. They had to know, I would yeah, think. But yeah. either way. And then uh, she... They didn't bother. Maybe, maybe not. They, they might not have, but, you know. <laughs> dogs can get pretty heavy. Well, it was, it was supposed to be an empty box or a box full of, like, junk. It wasn't, oh, it wasn't right. supposed to be a dog. And if a dog, a dog crate, you know, that you can't see in, that'd be perfect. But, yeah, they, they, they drove out and they, she made a mistake and they were easily tracked. She, she gave the address of their hideout for the vehicle registration to be sent. <laughs> like, because you bought a vehicle for the Get away. And then right. it's like, oh, can you send the registration to this place in Tennessee? We're, <laughs> we're, Where we're going. Cabin. <laughs> but um, they were going to see a movie or, or a, no, a movie. It was a movie. And they crossed time zones and they were late. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> late. <laughs> like nothing going your way. Escape from jail, escape from prison. And uh, <laughs> people are chasing you with shotguns and everything. And you can't even see your. Can't even get oh, to the movie because of the movie. time zones. I think yeah, he was, that happens. the guy was fascinated with, uh, I think it was, he wanted to see sharks. It was a documentary on sharks. Okay. And they had to see a documentary on lions instead. I think it's what happened. Oh, oh that's terrible. Yeah, that's enough to commit another crime, right? <laughs> I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're that close to the take sharks. Take me back to prison. I couldn't see my <laughs> shark thing. I had to watch lions instead. <laughs> Sharks then, of the land. Who cares about sharks of the land? And then they went to the zoo, and it already closed for the day. Oh, no shit, but they didn't even get to see the lions that they had just watched the movie about oh, because man. it was closed, and it's not an aquarium, so there were no sharks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. just sign right back into prison at that point. Right? What's the point of being free? <laughs> <laughs> if I can't even see the movie I want and the zoo I want to go to. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you get out to freedom, and that's what you want to do is watch a movie and go to the zoo. I you maybe want to see family, maybe or something. I don't know. Yeah, it was a very strange. I I've never, I've never been to prison. <laughs> right, right. It was also kind of a May December romance. I think she was uh, forty seven, and he was twenty something, twenty five or something. So uh, normal age difference. Bit of, bit of an age difference there. Uh, yeah, he wasn't using her at all. <laughs> you know, uh, it may be a case we should look at because when I looked at it, that's normally what I would have thought. Like, oh, this is like a manipulative mm -hmm. prisoner who, you know. But when you look at it, he was like, he was like a helper in an armed robbery where somebody was killed, something like that. Like he didn't, okay. he didn't pull the trigger. And I, strangely, I think they actually were in love. When you look, look at the case, he he wrote her love letters after going back to prison when when he knew he was in it for he was already serving life, and then he got ten more years. Mm. Um, which I think he can still technically get out under in the state they're in, but but uh, was it Kansas what state was that? I don't know what state it was now, but uh, whatever. I think he could get out. But yeah, he wrote her these like sentimental letters and be an interesting case to look at. I think so, uh, so he wasn't Leslie Arnold. <laughs> 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 right. Yeah, he didn't make the most of his escape. He was he was not a successful escape uh, prison escape artist. No. They also made, you know, he was very tall and she was short. And then with the age difference, it was very tough to go anywhere, mm. you know, because the, the notice went out to everybody, like, look, yeah. be on the lookout for her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like he was six foot two or something. It did, yeah, it was it was tough. Wow. It was a tough. Mm. Tough situation. Toby <sighs> Door, I think that was the case. We should take a look at that one. So we got to look out if, if, if Koberger starts having, uh, mailing uh, women. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he already has people. I, I'm sure. They're, oh, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure there are. Yeah, they're probably getting boxes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look at Ramirez. Ramirez had right. like, crates of letters. Jeez. Yeah, that is an interesting phenomenon. That I'm, it is. I, I don't know. It, it's hybristophilia. I think it's called. Right. I think that's what's called. Yeah. I, I've I've researched that before. Done videos on it's it's uh, it's something that happens every time with high profile killers. Mm -hmm. Every time. Mm -hmm. Scott Peterson. Right. Barrels, barrels of letters, or email, whatever you know now. But well, I'm, I'm not sure he's allowed to have email. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what the rules are. There's, there's certain prisoners that do. Yeah. Um, it's not. I don't think it's like traditional. Like it's just like a service they have to use or yeah. whatever. Uh, there's yeah. actually a there's like a website I saw. <laughs> I was looking at a case where you can contact the prisoners for like certain prisons mm -hmm. and like send love emails and like it's like some type of like really a dating service <laughs> um but it's a government data, data you know, con. it's government data con. you know it's for certain places yeah oh my gosh i think they might 
might want to rethink encouraging that, but yeah. uh, either way. There was a, they, they, should, they should just come up with date.con. Date.com. It's not a date.com. Good, date com. Good one. Good one. <laughs> and people trying to get to date.com would be like, oh, this isn't what I wanted. Or maybe they'd I find want. a new love in life. I don't know. You know, I think when people This is date, not what I wanted. Or is it? When, when people date, they're always worried, you know, are things going to go well or badly? <laughs> you, with that, you just remove the mystery. Right. At least I know where they are at all times. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to end in disaster. Right. I don't have to worry about the good part ever happening. There's no insecurity <laughs> about where are they. <laughs> it's That's true. It That's does true. solve that. Right? It does. So unless there's like a prison escape, they have to be worried. Oh, no, I hope. I hope he's okay. <laughs> I hope they didn't escape. <laughs> <laughs> there was an article um, uh, about Delaware prisons not too long ago about the communication systems that they use. And there was some service that was provided by some big company, and the inmates had to uh, – they have to pay for it, whether it's email and they have to pay a certain amount for – videos and other media and things like that and just how much they have to pay was the problem that inmates had yeah obviously you're in prison you're doing you know making money or something however you do that uh but they had to pay per text they had to pay per minute of calls and per whatever for videos and all this stuff and uh, it was really interesting because obviously they want to keep in touch with family but there's a company in that case anyway that's making millions off of inmates paying for their service to be able to email and paying ridiculous amounts too, you know, kind of unnecessarily. Like obviously they did something wrong and kind of their payback to society, you know, but they're paying it to a company, literally paying money mm -hmm. that they've earned from whatever. And it was a really weird thing. It was a perspective that I had never thought about before how inmates communicate with the outside world and watch videos and so forth. Uh, and I never thought about it, but there's companies that are benefiting monetarily in very big ways from that. Uh, I think that's a huge injustice uh, yeah. of that, uh, you know, among many, I'm sure, in that system. Uh, but it's an interesting perspective. I am, yeah. I am not a fan of the, the penal industrial complex. Mm -hmm. Like it is, it is the, the, the penal system in this country is not great at all yeah, it's broken uh, it, it's, it is yeah. very very broken uh I, I don't i do understand that there is a visceral need for for retribution when it comes to crimes yeah, especially right. a crime like like this well one. you have violence yeah uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but yeah. but there is the like i said at this point prisons are just trade schools for criminals mm -hmm. um because of the way they're treated it's the the system itself reinforces recidivism uh, and and teaches people just how to be better criminals, which ends up putting them back in prison. Uh, it just becomes cyclical, and it's terrible. Uh, and I I don't I don't want to endorse that 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 system at all. I actually was looking for a job recently. I saw a posting uh, on Indeed, and it was like a twenty thousand dollars sign on bonus, mm. uh, and like a salary that's way higher than what I was making. I was like. I'm intrigued. Yeah, right. And then I look further into the listing, and it's like, oh, this is a young, J uh, you know, Howard J. Young Correctional Facility. Ooh. I'm like, oh no. Ooh. I'm like, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> they clickbaited. Now you. they did. They clickbaited <laughs> yeah. me with the salary and the bonus. I was yeah. like, now I know why the bonus is that big, right. and why the salary is that big, because nobody in their right mind would do that. That's mm, the that's Newcastle tough. County. That's a tough jail, and it's a very, very tough. The K the Gander Hilton. Yeah, it used, used to be called Gander, Gander Hill. Hill. Used to be called Gander Hill. Lo locally, we call it Gander <laughs> Hilton, but. Yeah. But yeah, now it's uh, yeah Howard J. Young or whatever. Right. But it's always Gander Hilton my, to me. My, my rule number one: don't go to prison. Mm -hmm. That means in any capacity. I've only broken that once. And I was I had a friend who was in for a few months, and he wanted to visit. I went and visited him. But you know, I was working as a security guard at one point, and uh, took the the Beltway around Wilmington, great, right to the to the site, and then the bridge on went. Uh, was shut down for a while, so I had to route through the city, and the route took me right past Gander Hill, mm -hmm. right past Jan mm -hmm. Howard J. Ron Every time I drove past it, I'm like, I'm too close. I'm <laughs> well, too I think close. it's on 12th Street, right? Yeah. I think it's on, off of 495. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you drive right by, and there's all, you know, barbed wire and uh -huh. really lovely building. And yeah. the scrapyard is right behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the best scrapyard in the area, i got to say. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that's a pipeline kind of thing, or they get out of there, and they're like, let me get a job there. I don't know if that's the case, but. It's a good scrapyard. Yeah, but there's definitely no way to like throw a tube with masks over the <laughs> over the fence line <laughs> into the yard there. Only happens in certain prisons, apparently. Although if you were MacGyver, you go in the scrapyard, you could probably build a contraption to launch it That's over right. it. 
into there. Yeah, it's it's a really uh, that one the one in Smyrna that prison. I think that one in Smyrna is actually supposed to be worse. Mm. Yeah, well, that's it's supposed to be like the that uh, Howard Jang is the, the the holding facility. It's the detention center. Uh, so and James T. Vaughn is the other James one. James T. Vaughn is the yeah. other one, which I saw a listing for Vaughn too. Is the, the sign on bonus was higher? Oh, yeah. wow. And I was just like, ah, oh, no. Oh. Welcome to the secure housing unit. <laughs> yeah. No. yeah. That's that's the prison. <laughs> that's the prison prison. It's supposed to be the prison prison where people are. That's just, what lifers, yeah. Yeah. So anyone sentenced for or if for any, uh, anything over a year, we're, we're supposed to get a Smyrna. Anything under a year is supposed to be at Gander Hill or people who need to go to a court hearing, right. even if they're they from Smyrna. It, like yeah. they, get, they get transferred up to Young. Uh, for a while, so because it's really close to the Newcastle County Courthouse, they can just be taken right from to and from. Um, that's not the way it works, but it's supposed to be the way it works mm. or worked. Um, now, like they're just either either place. Like, oh, we don't have any room at at, at uh, Howard J. Young right now, so you're going to go down to to Vaughn. Wait, but I'm only in for three months. Yeah, eh, you'll do it at Vaughn. Yeah. You might not make it that long. It's like, yeah. I'm a lifer. Okay, we're going to put you in, in uh, Gander Hill. Like, okay. Terrible, it's a terrible system. Yeah, it, it is a terrible system. It's not, right. it's not, uh, it's not ideal. Mm -hmm. uh, I wish I had a better idea for how it should work. Um, in fact, I actually do have a bunch of ideas, but and I, nothing coherent. You right should now. take the job with a big sign-on bonus. Yeah, no. Uh-uh. <laughs> Work your way up to happen. I'd love be able to, to give ideas. I'd love to work for the state, but not not in that capacity. Not in that not, capacity. Not, yeah. not in the prison system. No way. Uh, it always pays a little better, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, there's a reason. And there's, there's a, a reason, reason for that. Right. Right. Hazard pay. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It's not a safe place. So uh, final thoughts on the case of Brian Koberger. What do you think, Jeff? Uh, <clears throat> I was going to mention about uh, Kelly Gonvaldez. Um, her, am I, am I saying, let me make sure I'm saying that. Consalves. Right. Consalves. Yeah, Consalves. Um, I'd seen a few interviews with her dad. Um, he was, uh, all the interviews he gave, he gave, you know, were just great considering what it, what had happened and the kind of place that his mind must have been in. He, he was, um, obviously very focused on, he just, he wanted justice, right? He wants justice. And, there was a period of time there, I want to say maybe seven weeks or so, where nobody was really hearing anything from the police. They hadn't released any information about evidence or leads or anything like that. And rightfully so, understandably so, uh, the parents of the victims and the friends of the victims and the community were getting really impatient. They really wanted answers. And he and probably many other people took it upon themselves to um, – try to find some of those answers. And I don't know how they did it, but maybe they hired people, I don't know. But he had said that uh, it was it went so far as people in the community were kind of the rumor mill. They were accusing other people. They thought, well, maybe this guy did it. And uh, her father said that there were instances where people would be in his house, in his kitchen, proving their innocence, trying to prove their innocence. See, look, I don't have any, they lift up their shirt. See, look, I don't have any scars on me from where somebody might have tried to fight back or something. And it was really interesting. And it's, uh, if I were in that situation, uh, you know, I, I would, of course, want answers too, as anybody would. And it's really interesting um, of that kind of grassroots, community-based, let me try to find answers kind of thing. And I don't know if that helped or hurt the cause. Uh, maybe it just added to more of that internet sleuthing kind of thing. But um, it, it was, <clears throat> in Kaylee's memory, it was one of those things that was like, you know what? I, I understand why he did that. I understand why he wanted to advocate so much uh, for his daughter and the other victims. Mm -hmm. um, but it must just be a terrible place to be, a terrible place in your mind that that not only happened, but now you feel like you have to do something because you feel like the people who are supposed to be doing something, the police, aren't doing enough. And kind of insult on, on top of injury, um, or maybe the other way around, whatever. Uh, it's, yeah, it's a horrifying thing. Mm -hmm. And I can only imagine what that must be like for a parent to experience that for their child. And to have it be so high profile, right? right? Like... 
and that, um, that has to make it worse. Yeah, yeah that because that, that attention is not going to do anything good. I mean, although it can bring awareness, like if you want to advocate, right. I guess that's that's true. Something, that, mm -hmm. yeah, like uh, Adam Walsh. Yeah, in that case, he he turned that's that right. into you know, a project to help others. Mm -hmm. Any other final thoughts? No, good, good, good. Mike. So the first time I heard about this case was I was actually at work. It was lunchtime. I sat down with some of my coworkers, some of my, my uh, supervisees. Uh, one of them turned to the other. was like, so did you hear about the Idaho 4? And she's like, oh, I've been following that. And I'm like, wait, I haven't heard about this because it was November. Like it had like just happened. And mm -hmm. I, and they, but they were already in it. Like, I think it was two days after. And they were already in it and following every bit of it. And I was like, I have to figure this out. Like, what's going on? Uh, so I started following a little bit afterwards, um, and then it became a big thing when uh, when he was when Brian Koberger was being being uh, arrested or had just been arrested because it was in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania. We were at, I mean, we're, it was a drug and alcohol facility in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. It's about two hours away. Um, Kennett Square and Albrightsville are about two hours separate. Um, but it's still, it's Pennsylvania. It's like it's home territory. Like it hits home. Like mm -hmm. this guy is from our area. I'm like, like but coming from Delaware, I'm like, yeah, but <laughs> like two hours, if I drive two hours, I'm no longer in Delaware anymore. Mm -hmm. no. No. Um, even if I, you know, head south after two hours, I'm probably in Maryland <laughs> at that point. I think um, you can make it to, you can make it to DC in two hours from here. Yeah, because right, it's such a small state. I think DC is like a hundred miles. Yeah, so Very, yeah. yeah, yeah. So two hours is quite some distance. Yeah. yeah, so two hours, like driving two hours and still being in the same state is a little foreign to me. <laughs> but uh, in Pen it's Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is a very large state, so two hours, like, hey, that's that's local, and uh, it, it hit them a little bit harder than it did me when it was like, it, you know, just a, just a local person mm -hmm. who did this. Um, and I just, I look at Koberg and I'll be like, the only way I think this guy is not guilty is if it is some fantastical Hollywood story. And and to be honest, sometimes the the real true stories are way better than anything Hollywood's come up with. Um, I'm sorry, the, the Valo Daybell thing is yeah. is way <laughs> crazier than Gone Girl. Right. right? Like uh, some of the, some stuff that just is out there, crazy weird stuff happens and sometimes it doesn't come up until trial. Mm -hmm. And like I said, the only thing I think that he's not guilty is if it's something weird like that. If it's some sort of strangers on a train, Hitchcockian weird thing that happened where somebody else actually committed the crime and, you know, managed to pin him, pin it on him and they're able to prove it in court. I, I but even then I think he would still had have had something to do with it, at least in the planning. Yeah. But I, I, I got to say, when we, we look at people like Koberger, if we can, if we, we need to start working on that beforehand, before it gets to the point of murder, mm -hmm. yep. as there were definitely signs that something wasn't going well with him. I mean, mm -hmm. he went to rehab. He, he was using substances. He went to rehab. Things were not going well in his mm -hmm. life. Now, I don't think that everybody who goes to rehab ends up going out and killing people. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'm dead sure that I've worked in rehab for years. Uh, but I do know that there are enough people in rehab who have killed people. That it's something we need to start taking a look at before they get to the point where they have to go to rehab. Mm. And it almost always is much earlier in life than people expect. Yeah, the, the substances, I mean, they were involved on both ends of this case. Um, they they might have been part of the formation of the killer, and they might have been part of the vulnerability for the victims. Mm -hmm. So it's it's just interesting because that footprint of substances is on so many homicides we cover at one level or another, either during it or before it. Um, and yet, you know, there's a love affair, right? There's a love affair between the United States and substances. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's never going to end. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's just it's just so expensive. I, I, I just can't imagine it's worth it. If things had been addressed for him earlier in life... He wouldn't. It wouldn't have come to this if he's the person who committed this crime. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't. He wouldn't have if some of those issues had been addressed earlier in life. 
Well, it'll be interesting to see as this progresses. I'm pretty sure he's going to be convicted, and I hope that he does talk. It's not good for him for appeals, obviously, right. but uh, I hope he does talk because it would it would be interesting at the other side of the story <clears throat> and hear his life story and how this unfolded in his mind because there was a lot going on in his mind. He was putting a lot of things together right. to to orchestrate this crime that he mm. uh, allegedly committed. Yeah. So, any thoughts for an item? <sighs> I don't know. Uh, I think maybe a glove or a sheath. Knife could sheath. Do, could do an could Elantra. Do an, no, do I was thinking a Hyundai Elantra. Yeah. <laughs> and so many other vehicles that we're putting on the table. Yeah, so. that's true. I know we're still bare. We're, we're, we're like fourth episode. I, I do have my our snake almost completed. Uh, it's been printed out. It's it's in the shape of a two. It stands up on its own. I just have to be able oh, to man. paint it. That's Very incredible. Good. Bring it in. Um, that'll that'll be our, our representative of season two. It'll be right on the table in the shape of a two. Uh, and I'm working on a couple of the only, the bear, the cocaine bear. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, I got to bust out my uh, resin printer. Mm. <laughs> I, I tried it with the PLA printer. It just didn't work. <laughs> For this one, I'm thinking either a sheath or, um, yeah, a sh the sheath or maybe just a glove. Mm-hmm. I can't think of really any other objects. The, the the Elantra, the house, not much. Garbage can, a garbage bin? Gar garbage can. It could yeah, be a garbage can. Yeah. I mean, we had a dumpster fire for <laughs> right. it, previously. Um, so maybe, yeah, maybe we'll do just a trash can. That's a good idea. We'll do a trash can or a sheath. We'll leave it up to our uh, our faithful audience. To yeah. Let yep. me know which one to print. <laughs> and please put any comments in the comment section. We're going to try to uh, reply to them uh, in shorts, I think, right? We talked mm -hmm. about to yeah. look and see if there's we'll look and see if there's any today uh and and use that you know it's a a different way of communicating and, and staying in contact and of course if you have any ideas for other episodes we we threw out the toby door case uh, and uh i was going to bring up the um natalia grace as an idea that's not a murder but as another case uh, uh if anybody's interested in that one uh please put a comment as always thank you for watching We'll be back with more episodes of The Murder Part and Alien Lizard Humanoids quite soon. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon.